It is fair to say, it is fair to say that the most controversial topic in Newfoundland and Labrador these days, well, it's not what's in the budget that's going to come down next week, though I'm sure this topic will probably get mentioned somewhere in the budget speech. Uh, it is not what's happening with health care. It is not what we're doing with education. Not what's going on with road work, though certainly there's been a tremendous amount of that been talked about and will be discussed and will be looked for in the budget. No, I think it's fair to say, by far and away, the biggest thing, the biggest controversy, if that's even the right word for this, is the whole issue surrounding the future development or not of the Muskrat Falls Hydro uh, opportunity. Uh, we have invited in, and uh, he has accepted and is here now, just getting ready, by the way, in case you're wondering why I'm talking. It's because he's late, and I just want all of the employees over at Nalcor to know that, that you're now entitled to at least one five the 15 minute late time that, and look here I'm breathing he was in a rush good morning Ed Martin good morning Randy how are you doing not too bad traffic out there isn't there a little bit of traffic out there and uh, you know I guess I had to talk to some people about some business here this morning well that's like, it that's is it that, is that a good enough excuse that's going to work for you today uh, Ed Martin of course CEO of Nalcor what we're going to do this morning is uh, we're going to open the lines primarily and just say okay look ask what questions you want this morning speak to Mr. Martin uh, about any of the issues surrounding uh, Muskrat Falls, or I'm going to say generally at hydro development in in a broader sense, even if you want. While we're focusing on Muskrat Falls, Nalcor is involved in a lot of other uh, energy projects and other opportunities and whatnot. And if somebody wants to throw something out at you, I guess we'll allow them to do that. Sounds good, right? You're okay with that? Absolutely. Obviously, the focus is going to actually be on the things associated with Muskrat Falls. So here's how we're going to do this, similar to how we have done it in the past. Uh, we are going to give uh, Mr. Uh, Martin here an opportunity to have a few uh, words to say, an opening, if you will, a, kind of an opening comment on where things are or where you see or where the, you hope they are. We're going to uh, invite you to uh, make a phone call, uh, have a chance to chat with Mr. Martin a little bit. We're going to go a little further. Generally, sometimes what we do in these things, Ed, as you know, is we have basically taken a phone call from someone. Uh, we let them ask a question. While you answer the question, we go to the next call. I'm going to change that a little tiny bit this morning because this is such a complicated issue. Uh, unless we're going to end up with, with uh, you know, somebody who's particularly opposed to the project, I don't want us to engage in, uh, uh, you know, big outspoken debates here. I think this is all about trying to get a little education for everybody. So, uh, you know, but if you have a second question, we'll give you an opportunity, hopefully, to be able to, to ask something supplementary and whatnot. Let's not take up too much time because we want to get through callers if we can. Okay. Item number two, open line at vocm.com is our email. If you've got a question, I've got it open right in front of me. Feel free to do it. In fact, i got one or two here now, I think. And uh, hopefully we're going to be able to get uh, to your questions that way as well. If you're on Twitter this morning, you could follow us there. And certainly if you have a question that way. You're going to have to really be succinct because on 140 characters, you don't get to say a lot. Uh, but uh, feel free on open line at vocm.com and obviously here on the phone. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, Ed Martin, we haven't even given you a coffee yet. That's the rush you got in here with. We'll try and... We'll try and solve that problem for you before uh, before we get too far into the morning. First and foremost, welcome aboard. Glad to have you again. Thanks, thanks very much, Randy. Good morning. And uh, it has been, uh, it is fair to say, since the Public Utilities Board issued their report, or non-report. Well, by the way, what do you call it? How did you feel about what they did? Well, I looked. Uh, you know, we always try to take the best out of whatever we get because we're trying to improve this project. Uh, you know, with every review that we have. Uh, if you look at the PUB report, uh, I stand back and say, you know, what's in there? Well, they they, they did make the statement in that report that. Um, the information that uh, we did provide uh, from a, what we call a decision gate two, or the November 2010 data, right. uh, in which was really a concept selection. At that point, we say, look, we have several options, many, many options. Let's go through those and pick out an option uh, or two that we know are the best options, and let's study those and keep going on those. So at that point, we provided uh, you know a bunch of information to ourselves, and that's what the PUB had in front of them. And they uh, did uh, note in their report... Uh, noted that what MHI had come up with, Manitoba Hydro, to say that, yes, based on the information at that point, 
um, the decision that we've made to go ahead with Muskrat Falls is correct. But what the PUB uh, went on to say, um, which uh, which which uh, I think the way it was said bothered me a little bit, uh, but 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 frankly, what they said was that the information that they would require or anyone would require to make a, a decision at at uh, at, a, at a at a sanction point or when we're going to actually start putting shovels in the ground. Um, they said the information that is required to make that final decision, they did not have. Well, that's correct. Uh, the information wasn't available. It's still not. We're getting that finalized and ready now to bring to uh, to the province and bring into the House, actually, to make a final decision. So uh, when I look at, at, at what at the way it was said, it was it was uh, it was unfortunate because really they said yes, we had the information and agree with MHI that it was a correct decision for a decision gate two. The information that we provided wasn't complete or wasn't in a form ready to make a decision gate three sanction decision. We knew that. Manitoba Hydro looked at the data that we provided and agreed with our assumptions. Navigant looked at the data we provided and agreed with our assumptions and our recommendation. How do you and deal with uh, how do you how do you deal with uh, the fact that and I, and I even wrote about it because when you think about what the PUB did. I said they were in a no-win, devil, you know, rock in a hard place, a no-win circumstance uh, for them. Uh, shouldn't we have, given how the PUB report rolled out and how the work was being done and the commentary that was made, shouldn't we have anticipated this? And I remember, you know, comments from the chair of the PUB about uh, the time, the timeline not being adequate to get the job done satisfactorily. Uh, then the complaints that came uh, subsequent to that over Nalcor's uh, being lead-footed uh, sort of thing and not getting information to them quickly enough and so on. Couldn't we have, to some degree, had we been all looking at this thing from a, maybe a, a little broader pr perspective, anticipated that the PUB wasn't going to really be able to do anything else because they really never got the kind of time that they wanted right from the get-go? Well, Randy, uh, the PUB stated from the outset that they needed to hire some expertise to take a look at this. Mm -hmm. And they went and hired uh, Manitoba Hydro International, who have had experience in these kinds of things. And what I point to is to say that Manitoba Hydro went through the information, and in the time provided, they came up with a recommendation and a report. A report we found useful. They had some recommendations, but generally they aligned with what we were saying, gave us marks for being best practice in many, many, many areas, and said, here's some extra things you can look at. From our perspective... Uh, Manitoba Hydro had the time to do that. They provided the report. We found it useful, and we're working with it. You mentioned uh, Nelcor, uh, you know, being lead-footed. Um, you know, I take a little ex exception to that. Uh, you know, well, I'm that was certainly that was certainly the impression that was left from the PUB and from the chair that they were looking for information, and you guys were slow providing documentation, etc. Yeah, so, so I, mean, you know, I mean, let's look behind that for a second. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, uh, the PUB report, was uh, you know we were asked to participate that, or, or, uh, you know, by the government in a March time frame. We weren't anticipating that at the time, but great, uh, you know, another opportunity. So we had to realign resources. We had to realign the work that we were doing, going towards D DG3, using a lot of the same people, naturally, who have the expertise in this area. At the same time, we had a Navigate report that was ongoing. <laughs> and uh, amongst all the other work and preparations for, um, you know, for getting this project off the ground. So mm -hmm. we started in um, a little behind the eight ball time-wise. And uh, as we as we started providing the information, it became apparent that the the depth and the level of information that the PUB and the MHI were looking for was deeper than we had expected. We said, "Fine, that's very helpful." Again, and and I actually made the call to say, "Look, uh, folks, um, you know, quality is is going to be the most important thing here. We need them. We need to be presenting this information in a format that people find useful and can understand. We just can't start throwing things over the over the wall and hope mm -hmm. for the best. That's not very helpful either." So I made that call to make sure we had quality data. And um, and in some cases, we missed uh, some deadlines. We had to do some more work to get that data there. But from my perspective, we explained that to the PUB. We explained it to MHI and the government. And I said, look, that is the best thing for the province to do that. I also look at MHI's report. And, and I th you know, I, I think we need to judge a project of this size, not on, on uh, you know, on, on some paperwork that uh, we had to provide in a, in a more quality f format, but I think you have to look at it in terms of what did an MHI say about the quality of our processes to execute a very, very large project. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's the yardstick we need to look at. That's the most important thing to the people of the province. Do we have the expertise? Do we have the processes? Are we ready to do this kind of job in MHI? Yeah. Uh, MHI had concluded uh, uh, that yes, 
um, we did, and we do have those processes. And I think that's the most important piece in terms of, of, of understanding our ability uh, and the quality of our people well, to people execute this job. But people look at how this came down with the PUB, which, which I think the PUB thing is, has, has caused you know, you know some grief, obviously. But, but people look at how that came down, and then they look at the time frame that the PUB in Nova Scotia has been given to look at the Amira part of the deal, and they were given quite a broad window of time when the PUB in Newfoundland and Labrador seemed to be left with the impression there was a lot of pressure put on them to do this and do it quickly. And uh, don't you think that given how distrustful people are over this whole process and the project, that that was not a very smart move? Randy, I, I'll go back to the point I made, I made earlier. Um, you know, the PUB hired expertise to do this review. They hired Manitoba Hydro to do this review. Manitoba Hydro completed this review uh, in the time that was provided and uh, came up with a, with, a, with a detailed report. And as I said, it's the information that we find most useful. <laughs> So if I look at it again, I say to myself, well, MHI was there, they had a report, they gave us good information, and, um, and uh, yes, there was enough time to do it. All right, with that, we are going to go very quickly go to break. I understand from our producer we are we're, we're getting busy. That's good. So if you've got a comment, if you've got a call uh, that you want to make this morning, uh, Mr. Martin is here, ready to take your calls and hopefully provide some uh, needed information and maybe answer some specific questions that uh, you may have on your mind, and we're looking forward to giving him that opportunity. We're going to go pay our bills, and uh, then we're coming back and we're taking your calls. You stay with us. Okay, we are back now. We've managed to get a coffee for Mr. Martin, and we're ready to go. Are you ready to go, Ed? Ready to go. All right, we're going to start here. Yeah, hit that red button there. There you okay. We got you. All right, we're going to go to line number three, and that's where we're going to start this morning and say good morning to Dan. Hi, Dan. Good morning. How are you today? I am well, sir. Question for Mr. Martin? Yes, I do. Uh, Mr. Martin, how are you today? Good morning, Dan. Uh, listen, you're doing a good job, and uh, no one wants to have your job for all the tea in China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, but uh, at the rate he's paid, he can buy all the tea in China. Don't worry about Martin; he's okay. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, I think the big problem with uh, selling this uh, Muskrat Falls is there's a lot of skepticism out there. Uh, you know that, uh, and that stems from the Upper Churchill uh, deal, and, that. and so people, when it comes to the to this deal, they're sort of putting two of them together. And you know, uh, I think that uh, uh, Hydro has to be a little bit more. Uh, out for it with, uh, with some of the, uh, the stuff that they're trying to promote. And one of the things is, is the financial aspects of it. And I know, uh, it's six point something billion dollars. But I want to know, uh, the money has spent up to date. Uh, my question is, the money has been spent up to date. What have we spent up to now? Yeah, you know, yeah, but I want to know, is that included? In the 6.2? Yes. Yes, no. uh, yes it is. That yes. is included. So in other words, every, uh, the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars we spent every day or month or whatever it is, I don't know, uh, is that uh, that's, uh, that's being included right at the moment. Yeah, so, so two points there. One is uh, we are spending approximately 12 to $15 per month at this point. 12 to $15 million. Uh, Sorry, 12 to $15 million <laughs> per, uh, yeah, uh, per month uh, right now, and we have expended, uh, you know, dollars to date uh, doing things like the um, uh, the engineering, the environmental assessments, uh, our work with the Indian Nation, all the pro project financing work and, and project execution work, but those dollars are included in the $6.2 billion. Well, there's uh, one other question I'll let you go because I know coming lots of other people. Is there any way possible that, uh, say, like the end of this month, or the end of next month or whatever, that there could be a, a financial statement and let go by you people, the, 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 the people of the province up to date, what's going on, so they have more of uh, an idea. You mean to show what's been spent on this project that's yet to be sanctioned, you mean? Yes, that's what I mean, uh, because if a lot of people are saying, you know, there's all this money being spent, we don't know where it's going, and, you know, and they're condemning the project, and this could be the best uh, project since sliced cheese. I, I, I really don't know. I, I, I'd like to see the project go, but I'm still skeptical about, about everything, right? All right, Dan, thank you for that. He, he makes a very good point and a very interesting question. Thanks, Dan. Can, can you do that? Can financial figures say, here's what we've spent on this so far? Absolutely. And uh, we've been very public about that over the last several years, but what we're spending, so it would just be a matter of giving an update. And uh, we've It's done a it. substantial we'll amount of money gone on a project that's never been sanctioned. Yeah, yeah, I'd just like to comment on that as well. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll go over the figures in just a moment, uh, if we like, but... Uh, remember that um, you know when you when you when you're doing a project of this nature, a 6.2 billion dollar project, 
um, it's been proven, it's known uh, worldwide that the best thing you can do is get a certain level of certainty before you start the project. And uh, I'll go back to the house analysis. You don't want to go into a house and buy a piece of land and, and, uh, and say to your spouse, let's build it. And you don't say it's a two-story, you don't say it's four bedrooms, you, you, don't, you don't say anything. They say, let's just start building that house. And you get into that house and you start changing it and changing your mind every way along the way, you know that house is going to cost you a lot more than if you had done the plans up front. If you'd spend a little ex extra money up front to do the blueprints, to make sure you have everything clear, exactly what you want it. And that's what we're doing right now. And it's been proven that if you, you really need to spend up to 5% or so of the total capital cost prior to going into a decision, and you're better off to do that and get into the actual construction knowing what you So it will be about 5% of the $6.2 billion. That's what we're aiming for. Is that's, uh, where it'll be, somewhere around there. And that's going to give us the definition we need. <clears throat> All right, here's a very quick one for you before I go back to the phone uh, from our open line at VSCM. Mr. Martin, why wouldn't we build a line from the Upper Churchill to the island and purchase power from Hydro-Quebec for six cents until 2041 when the power returns to Newfoundland and Labrador? So we looked at that, and um, you know, I guess ourselves, Hydro Quebec, any other company across the you know across the North America is uh, our business people, and uh, so what we did as a proxy for that kind of analysis is said, what would uh, Hydro Quebec's alternative be in terms of selling to us? So the alternative would be is what they could sell it in other markets. So we took those numbers in terms of what was in the other markets. We added transmission fees, which you have to pay to get it here. Uh, we brought that in as far as Churchill Falls. We looked at the expenditures we take to get from Churchill Falls to, uh, to Soldiers Pond, once again, the whole Labrador Island link. And when we ran those numbers, uh, it did not, uh, it did not beat, uh, Muskrat Falls in terms of, of, uh, of cost. Seriously? And, and I mean, well, that doesn't seem to make any sense. Well, you think about that for a second. Uh, in, in both cases, the Labrador Island Link is common. So really, you can take those kinds of expenses away because you have to put those in. Take those in, out, yeah. Take those out. So really what you're doing, you're comparing Muskrat Falls generation, the actual generation costs, to what costs you would get in the long term uh, you'd have to pay for in other markets. And Muskrat Falls, we've said from the outset, the generation, the generating plant at Muskrat Falls is one of the top two projects left in North America from a hydro perspective. It's just absolutely excellent. The other one's Gull. So Muskrat Falls and Gull are the top two hydro prospects left in the island. It's very, very cost-effective power. It's just they're, they're just great sites that should have been developed 40 years ago. Mm, they should have been developed long before now. Oh, I mean, if if, if we if we didn't have the politics involved here with Hydro Quebec and such, uh, you know, you would have seen uh, even across the country these projects were stacked in the top five. So you would have seen after uh, after Churchill, you would have seen Gull and Muskrat come right after that at the same time as some of the Quebec projects and others. They're just great projects, but the politics didn't allow that here. We are going to go to line number five, and we're going to say good morning to Everett. Hi, Everett. Hi, good morning, Randy. My name is Everett Farwell, uh, calling in from Bjorn. How are you, Everett Farwell? Good morning to you, buddy. Yes, sir. Good morning, Everett. Yes, and uh, good morning to you, Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin, my question is, uh, <coughs> uh, prior to being elected in 2003, Premier Danny Williams said that he would uh, have a study conducted into the feasibility, viability of... Uh, a fixed link from the Ireland portion of our province to mainland Labrador. Uh, my question is, uh, during the planning stages for Musret Falls, uh, why wasn't uh, the fixed link considered as a means of transmission uh, of the power from Musret Falls to the Ireland portion of our province, recognizing the fact that uh, uh, Premier Danny Williams uh, did conduct the study, and he said it would be feasibility, possible, and viability uh, with uh, the completion of the Trans-Labrador Highway, and that is now under construction. And to me, that would have been another reason to develop Musret Falls, to have that Think link completed in conjunction with the transmission of the power. All right. Mr. Martin, that, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, well, two, two points there. The first point is, uh, from Muskrat Falls' perspective, uh, you know, uh, we can't look at a, a fixed link, Which, in, and by terms of a fixed link, I mean a, a tunnel big enough to carry cars and other things because the project just wouldn't bear the cost. But that being said, we did look at uh, burying the, or tunneling the cable across uh, underneath the strait versus laying the cable uh, pretty much on the strait. Mm -hmm. And um, and we had two teams looking at that, one team doing the subsea on, on, the, on the floor and the other team looking at the tunnel. What we came up with was uh, we, we, uh, we, we actually did a lot of what they call borehole drilling, basically had, uh, had a vessel out there drilling down deep into the rock to see the quality of the rock. And, uh, and the quality of the rock uh, that was coming back to us was not great. 
Uh, we found it shaly. Uh, we found it, uh, you know, uh, more uncertain and not as solid as we thought. And what that does is uh, to us is okay, uncertainty. We got to add contingency. Uh, because, you know, we expect we're going to get into some trouble doing a tunnel down there because of the, wa- the rock quality. And once we loaded up the contingency and the uncertainty on the going uh, going with a tunnel option, it became clear to us that laying on the seabed is the better option. Even though there's there's real ice considerations there, or are there ice considerations? There's got to be. Uh, well, you know, we've, we've, we've been blessed by nature uh, up there in the strait. And uh, the best analogy I like to use is that there's a natural, there's a natural berm up in the strait. Uh, I call it a, a bowl, I guess. So, uh, so ice coming down from Greenland. Uh, if it's going to hit this natural barrier before it goes across, uh, before it gets into the strait, and it's going to roll off and go a certain size mm-hmm. icebergs. Mm-hmm. The icebergs that can cross over the lip of that bowl actually come into the bowl, and they may sink down somewhat, but they are they will they will never hit the bottom uh, of, the, of that of that because you have that natural protection for the size of the bergs. We continue to do some extra study. We found that there were some cases, though, very remote, but there were some cases where if that iceberg had tipped. You might be able to nick something, uh, you know. We're talking about something that might happen every thousand years. Mm. So what we did there, we said, even even to cover that kind of risk, we said to ourselves, well, we get, you know, if you look at the cables, we actually got three cables up there, three 450 uh, megawatt cables, and we count 900 that we're going to use. We have a spare up there. We put them in different places. So we, by the, you know, with, with this natural ice berm, the fact we're drilling out from the sides to make sure nothing can touch the the uh, the, the the cable. What we're doing is laying the cable on the floor, which we're, 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 we're covering it with rock to help us, uh, to help us, uh, you know, with any, any, any fishing issues. But when we do the analysis now with the three cables, we know that we have protected ourselves not only from ice, but from other things that we have redundancy built in. All right. We are going to go now. Then thank you, Everett, for that. Everett, any final thought very quickly? No, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, buddy. Take care. All right. That's very interesting because, you know, the Apollo in the last three weeks or so, they've run into a spring ice situation where the ice actually went to the point that the ice breakers couldn't clear a channel across the strait because the ice actually got to the bottom. It actually piled piled up and piled on because of wind and nature to the point where the icebreakers, it actually got to the bottom. Uh, but you're, where these cables would be located now, where the channel is going to be located in this bowl, that's much fur- that's further south of that? You know, uh, well, what we're saying is that it, the place where the ice could, could cram up on the sides, yeah. we are actually tunneling both ways to a certain point. So what we did, we, 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 uh, we have the data that says, okay, that could happen in terms of the ice hitting, as I said, it's a bowl, so yeah. it, can, it hits the side. At areas where that ice could hit, we were actually tunneling below that. And coming down underneath it, and then laying the rest. So of the So there is, the there's no the, the the issue of reliability of the cable from the point of view of being underwater is not going to be. That's not a challenge. That's correct. All right, we're going to go now and say hello here on line number three. Going to say hello to Bernard. Hi, Bernard. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good. You have a question for Mr. Uh, Martin? Yeah, a couple actually. Um, now the most important uh, thing about this. Muskrat Falls to me is how much will I be paying per kilowatt hour when Muskrat Falls is complete? Yep. What are we paying? Okay. Yeah, so so what um, we, we've been through this before. The, the best answer to that question, uh, Bernard and Randy, I, I think, put it in terms of the people feeding back to me are saying, "Can you give me something I can, I can understand?" So what we say to them, or I'm saying to them, look, if your if your bill, uh, just pick a number, say it's two hundred dollars per month. Um, what we're saying is that by the time Muskrat Falls comes on, regardless of Muskrat Falls, that is going to be approximately forty percent higher than two hundred dollars per month. And that's going to get you into about the two hundred and eighty dollars per month. So Muskrat Falls will And that would be about what, twenty eighteen? Uh about twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen. Okay. Yes, and that's gonna happen regardless. Uh, because of the situation in Holy Road, the increased demand and the fact that we're using uh, oil and the oil price is going up. Mm-hmm. Um, when Muskrat Falls comes in, it's going to be in that $280 to $290 range. The difference is is that Muskrat Falls at that point will flatten out because hydro has very, very low operating costs, very, very low maintenance costs, and we're not tied to any type of oil after that. If we don't do it, What's going to happen is that $280 will continue to rise uh, aggressively and be volatile, tied into oil prices from here on in. So we're so uh, your oil bill is going to your oil bill. Forgive me, your light bill, high, high, your light and power is going to go up by about 40 percent between now and 2018. Anyway, with Muskrat Falls, it's it's not going to go up another 40 percent on top of that. It will simply that it will simply replace the oil that we're buying with hydro. That's correct. 280 bucks is where you're going to be on a $200 a month bill right now. Does that answer it for you, Bernard? Uh, apparently, anyway. But the next question I had in mind was, uh, why not wind power? 
So wind power, uh, Bernard, is something that um, that we've looked at uh, closely, and we're going to continue to look at. I, I believe there's going to be more room for wind. Actually, let me say that up front. Um, but here's why: uh, if we look at the two options, one is from an isolated island perspective with with, with no link. Mm-hmm. Versus a muskrat falls on the isolated island with no link. We're looking at uh, putting some wind into that mix. So not only Holyrood, we're looking at putting wind into that mix. And actually, I think we can put in more wind than we've been planning up to this point, And we're building that into our DG3 numbers. But that whole package of Holyrood wind, small hydro, all those things that are required from now for the next 50 years, we compare that to muskrat falls over the next 50 years. Muskrat falls is, is the is the lower cost option. So we select the muskrat falls. And that means that we're not going to develop that wind that we had talked about in the isolated. However, now we have Muskrat Falls. Now we have a link to the island, and now we have a link to uh, into Nova Scotia. There's excess capacity on that link. And we've always done the Muskrat Falls economics based on Muskrat only, but the reality is there's excess capacity. And our, and our view and our vision is the fact that we're going to develop more wind, we're going to develop more hydro, and we're actually going to be able to fill that link over time and do more developments because we have excess capacity available to us on that link. Is that a good business model to be considering in the future, given what's happening in America with energy these days? And I'm thinking of a fracturing, fracturing shale natural gas, the uh, the Americans' seeming obsession and commitment to developing its own energy sources no matter what these days. And the natural gas development seems to be the one that is really attracting great love from America these days. And, and our are we too late to the? Are we too late to the dance? Uh, absolutely not. And, and you look at uh, you know the reason we're doing this uh, you know in a conservative fashion is that we have kept our options open. So we've done Muskrat Falls. Uh, remember, we've done Muskrat Falls assuming there's no link. We've done Muskrat Falls Labrador Island Link alone, assuming we have no market for the excess power. We should compare that to the isolated island. Why? Because that's our decision. And that decision, if Muskrat Falls is the best decision in comparing those two, that's Newfoundland's decision. We're better off to do it, do it and don't get anything for the excess power. So, and it is. So we chose that as, a, as the option to, to move ahead. Now we have excess power. We have a way to get it there. We've done a deal that we can get in and make money, and we have, the, we have ourselves covered no matter what happens. As far as additional investments go, we won't do them if we're not going to make money, but we have protected ourselves because we've made the right decision ourselves, stand alone, and anything we get after that will be gravy, and we're not going to do something uh, that is not going to make us money in the future. I believe it will, but we still have the option. It's our option to do that at the time. Well, but right now, though, it's kind of like seal, it's, it's kind of like seal skins, right? The market looks bleak for hydro. Um, well, in our case, that's not correct, Randy, and, and the reason is this, is that um, remember, if I talk about the second decision now, so we made the first decision, Muskrat Falls, Labrador Island League is the best thing for us. Mm-hmm. So we spill the water where we don't get any for the excess power. Done. So we can move ahead. Take that excess power now. The actual arrangements that we've done with uh, with uh, with Amera is that we are are flowing uh, on their line in Nova Scotia, on transmission they have in New Brunswick, on rights that they have in New England, and we're only paying for those uh, those rights when we flow. That's a huge piece of the deal here because normally you have to pay for twenty four seven. You own them, you pay. Yeah, for you're, them. you're paying for capacity, not not just what you're actually exactly, delivering. Exactly. But, but part of the arrangements we have with the mayor is that we're only paying when we flow. So if we get in, I mean, what we have it right now, we can get into New England um, for only the tariff that we would have to pay when we flow. So assume that tariff uh, by the time you stack it up uh, comes into the ten to twelve dollar. Uh, per megawatt range, we'll say. Mm-hmm. If we go into that market, uh, what we do, it's a clearing market. It's always existing. It's there. Uh, we're selling into it all the time. It's, it's, uh, everyone bids in every hour. And the way that market works is that everyone bids up, and the last person who bids the highest amount, everybody gets that price all the way up. So if, if the first person bids five dollars, the next person bids ten, and you bid up as you bring on excess uh, generation and and the power needs go up, so you're paying more at breakfast than you are in the middle of the night. So breakfast time is the last person who bids in, the last company with a with a natural gas plant or a coal plant or hydro bids in at say forty three dollars. Everybody gets that. It's called a, clear, a clearing price. Mm-hmm. So as long as we beat that twelve bucks, uh, we'll always make money. And the way we, we do the bidding, the way we have the opportunity to do the bidding in that market is we go in and we'll say, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bid a strike price, it's called, meaning that we'll bid it. But if we don't want to take it, we don't have to. You don't have to. And we got the beauty of the big reservoirs up north. So if we're there... At, you don't uh, have to generate it. Either. We don't have to generate it. So we can store it up there. So if some morning we go in, and, and, and to me, it's, the prices are even nowhere near what I'm talking about. And this is the lowest prices we've had in decades. Mm-hmm. But even if, if it happened to go lower, we go in a bit of price, and it comes in lower than that. We can say, no, we're going to wait. We're going to wait till supper time. Put it back in the reservoir, and we'll wait. We'll never lose money on the on the power if, if Muskrat falls. So that's been covered off. Okay. Bernard, one final thought from you? 
Yes, and uh, if the overruns are, say, 20% more than it's already estimated, will that be, stick another 20% on the uh, estimated uh, amount that our light bill will increase? Yeah, does that, if there's, if there's cost overruns, does that flow to the end consumer as well? I guess, is that it, Bernard? Yes. All right, we're going to go on that note. Thank you, brother. Okay, thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. That's a good question. Yeah, in, uh, in the, in, the answer is yes. In the event that uh, that costs were higher, yeah, it would So if you guys blow the numbers, we're going to pay the bill. Um, I mean, just give me a minute. Let's back up for one second. There's always, you know, there's there, there's more information required than that. But I was, and in direct answer to the gentleman's question is, if it goes up 20 percent, will the light bills go up 20 percent? It's not it's not an exact number, but it's, it's close enough as a proxy, okay? Because capital costs are more upfront than long term. But I think we also have to look at um, the alternatives. Uh, you know, if if what happens uh, if we stay with uh, with with Holyrood and uh, the price of oil continues to go up, or the price of oil goes up higher than expected, uh, or or uh, capital cost on that side of things, a lot of capital costs involved in that side of things as well. Let's not forget mm-hmm. that because you're building new plants, you're building uh, you're building wind, you're building hydro over there as well. Um, so on, on on the flip side of it, you have the risks associated, the same types of risks associated with the capital cost. But in addition to that, you have the risks associated with uh, with volatile fuel prices over the long term. Over the long term. Okay. So you really have to look at it from both sides on this on this particular uh, equation. You always have to look at both sides of the equation. We are going to take a break, and when we come back, we want to speak with you on a question on the actual cost, six point two billion. We're going to get Mr. Martin to answer this question because somebody told me I heard the other day it's not six point two anymore. Now it's 7.3. We'll talk about that when we come back after the break, and you stay with us. Okay, we are back, and once again, we have Mr. Ed Martin, the CEO of Nalcor, here with us today. I'm going to go to Mr. Uh, Bruno Marcocchio, who is with the Sierra Group, uh, but just before I do, Ed Martin, somebody, I don't know who it was anymore, I forget now, uh, said that uh, there had been a number left out of the figures of $6.2 billion and that interest charges on things had not been calculated, and that in actual fact it was $7.3 billion. Is there any truth to any of that kind of stuff? Um, I, I don't know where the interest uh, piece is coming from, Andy, or sorry, uh, Randy. It's, um, it's you know, the interest rates, uh, we're clear on those, what we have in our economics. Uh, we understand what, we have a really good understanding of what the federal loan guarantee will do for it. Nothing has changed there. Um, but we'll say on a cost perspective, um, you know, this is what we're finalizing, and we don't have all of the numbers yet. We're very close. It's coming. Uh, but I want to just, uh, you know, let people know how, once again, how this will be looked at. We have to look at it uh, in terms of the full picture. If you look at what impacts rates. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, capital costs uh, will impact rates no matter what, which way they go. Operating costs will. Interest costs will be a, a, a huge piece of this because we're talking about borrowing over a significant period of time. Uh, so, you yeah. know, any change in interest rates is going to have a, a, an important impact on that. So all those things have to be looked at together. And it has to be looked at in terms of both options. The other, th- the other big piece when you look at both options is the oil price forecast. Where is the oil price forecast? Uh, where are they going? Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been going north. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of the isolated island uh, perspective, uh, that's going to be impacted as well. So we're putting together the full package. Once you pluck at one of those things, I can say to you, oh, my Lord, the isolated island, the oil prices are going up, so that's terrible. I'm, I'm not saying no, no. You can't say that, folks. Come into me with the full picture. What's the capital? What's the interest rates? What's the oil prices? And let people see. What the true comparison is, apples to apples, that's what the, that's what the decision has been made on this one. Is there a number, be it 6.2, 7.3, 8.9, is there a number that this could all come in at when you get to these new numbers that the PUB said they couldn't get at the time for Decision Gate 3? And that's sanction time, right? So decision Gate 3 is sanction time. That's correct. Is there a number that could come up now because of, let's say, 20% cost overruns or, you know, because everything is changing hourly in the construction business these days, that we would have to look at it and say, well, we can't go with these numbers? Is there a number out there you'd say, if it, if it hit that, we'd have to say no? Um, there's, always, there's always that number uh, because the comparison will be what's our alternative. And if something happened uh, that the numbers came in that were uh, you know equivalent or greater than the alternative, naturally, that's what I'm saying. So, if, so you guys have said the alternative is really 2.2 billion less than that's uh, uh, what, what it would be. So, so we got 6.2. We're talking 8.4. So if, if somebody showed up at Decision Gate three time and said, you know what, this is going to be an 8.7 billion dollar project now. At that point, we say no. At that point, we'd uh, we'd have to uh, yeah you know, we'd have to sit back and say uh, if it's equivalent to the alternative, which one do you want to do? It's a whole different ballgame at that point. So we'd have to sit back and say, would we want to do it on an equivalent basis? Different decision. 
but it certainly wouldn't be sitting back and saying, boom, we're going. There's no way. That's what we're trying to get to make sure we know those numbers before we make that call. But those numbers haven't changed in like 18 months, right? Uh, that's 6.2 billion. That that figure that's been stood out there, that number hasn't changed in like 18 months now. And, and you won't see any adjustment to that until we have the final numbers. Uh, you know, and that's really, uh, you know, that's pretty much ordinary practice as well, Randy, because, you know, look at the situation where any private sector or public sector, you don't leak out a piece of information here and a piece of information there uh, because it's not a complete picture. Unless you see these two alternatives, uh, with everything in, uh, with all of the new information and a complete picture, there's no sense in leaking out a bit here and a bit there and a bit there, up, down, or indifferent, because all that does is fuels uh, a debate that people say, why don't you give us all the information? We say, we're going to get that information. Mm -hmm. We cannot present it until we have the full picture. That's just good business practice. We are going to go now to line number one. Say hello to Mr. Bruno Marcocchio. Good morning, Bruno. Good morning, Randy, and uh, I welcome the opportunity to, uh, to speak to Mr. Martin. Uh, Mr. Martin, first of all, I'm struck by the difference between the information you're uh, dispensing this morning and what you already have on the public record. I'll just give you two quick uh, examples. Uh, first of all, your demand projections to justify the need for this project uh, say that there will be zero wind generation in Newfoundland after 2028. As outrageous as that sound, that's the projection you've made. Within the sensitivity uh, analysis of the cost of this project that MHI has done, uh, within the sensitivity analysis, it could be as much as 50% over the cost, which means 6.2, maybe 10 billion. And that needs to be kept in mind by everyone listening. Mr. Martin, you're asking ratepayers in Newfoundland and Labrador to assume all of the risks for Muskrat Falls. You've denied the two democratic oversight bodies, the Lower Churchill Review Panel, and the Public Utilities Board, the information to perform the crucial function of democratic oversight on expenditures that ratepayers depend on to protect them. There is no risk to Alcor if this proceeds because your returns are guaranteed, as you well know. Once you get the sanctioning, without anyone ever having a look at the numbers, your return is guaranteed. It's only the ratepayer that's on the hook. Let's look at the information that MHI has put on the record. And again, it's different than what you're trying to suggest this morning. MHI has warned that the design of the power lines are not consistent with industry practices. You've relied on a 50-year reliability in the analysis uh, versus a 150-year reliability, which is the industry standard. They recommend a 500-year reliability for the HVDC links. Hold on, hold on. Let, let's, let's kill the acronyms. What, what do we mean? Uh, well, they've decided... What are the HVD... What is it? Uh, high voltage DC, the links... Uh, HVD, the so high voltage DC line. Got you now. Go ahead. All right. And, uh, and so there's two of those links that we know about, the one to the island of Newfoundland and the one to the island of Cape Breton here where I'm at. Uh, so uh, rather than designing to industry standards, you've designed to a third of the industry standards. Uh, in addition, Alcorn does not comply with the North American Electrical Reliability Standards, according to MHI. That's, they're called NERC. On, uh, on the reliability assessment, your deterministic assessment that, that you use cannot guarantee the true risks associated with a power system and is unable to provide some of the important inputs for making sound engineering decisions, such as risk and associated costs, including large societal costs associated All right. I'm, okay, with I'm, I'm gonna all right, I'm going to stop you there because you've made you've made three critical points, uh, and before we get and before well, what's going to end up, Bruno, is we're going to be overwhelmed. So I'm going to stop you, take a breath for a second, all right, and I'm going to let Mr. Martin step in here if I can. I've got I've got two uh, two items listed: uh, power uh, demand projects, uh, the, the demand, and uh, the industry standard on power lines. Let's deal with those two first, Mr. Martin. Are you are you singing a different song today than was sung when uh, Manitoba Hydro? file the report? Uh, well, first thing, I'd like to say good morning to Bruno. Good morning. And um, so I'll just take a look at both of those questions first. The first one was on the, on the demand projections. I think uh, Bruno was suggesting that there's no wind uh, in post-2028, and there should be. Um, this is actually something that uh, we're looking to uh, adjust for in our next uh, DG3 go-around. Um, in the demand projections uh, that we put there initially, the, the, uh, it showed that we, we possibly could put some more wind in there, but we needed more study to be able to say it. And the reason we could possibly we put more wind in on the isolated island is that as the demand goes up uh, and we bring on more capacity, 
uh, we may have enough capacity to back up some more wind. So we're looking at that, and uh, in our next go-around here, um, coming up at DG3, um, I think, uh, well, we're looking at it, we may have enough to put in maybe 100, maybe 200 more megawatts of wind, depending on the demand projections and, and the reliability study. So so point taken on that one. Uh, that's been talked to us by MHI. We know we knew it ourselves. We just didn't have enough of the reliability stuff done to see if we could fit it in. So we're, we're likely going to have more in the isolated island option uh, when we move ahead. But that wouldn't be a determinant on whether you went ahead or not. No, absolutely not. It's going to, it's going to, it may adjust uh, some of the numbers uh, for comparison's sake, uh, which is which will be helpful because we want the right numbers. But we are going to try to to uh, to put more wind in there if the system will handle it to see if we can uh, adjust the cost of the isolated uh, island system down somewhat. Okay, so that could, Manitoba, that could be helpful. All right, Manitoba Hydro says could be f- over a run of fifty percent on this deal. Yeah, so we we've been uh, we've been looking at that. I mean, you know. We, I mean, what we use is, is construction standard industry um, uh, ranges uh, in terms of our estimates. So first thing I will say is that we have uh, some of the best people available uh, in the world today from a costing perspective. We're also using, um, um, you know, SSC Lavalin we brought on to go through and, and, d- and do more detailed engineering to give us the information. So we're, so we're content that we're producing the right numbers. So what we do then is that we say, look, at the very, very extreme, um, a DG2, uh, it could be minus 30 to plus 50. There's just as much chance of, of it being less than 30, less by 30 percent than it would be being greater than 50 percent. But the most important thing is on those curves is that really you got to look at the middle of those curves, and the range is much narrower in terms of really what's actually going to happen. We have a worst case analysis. We're just being public about it. You know, you never know what's going to happen. No one can ever. You know, take away every inch of risk, but the reality of it is, is that the range is, when you look at the curves, can be much narrower than that. And what we're in the process of doing now is, is taking those estimates and making them even narrower, so that we have a much better idea of where of the range of what this okay. project could happen to DG3. All right, I'm going to stop you there, Bruno. I'm going to stop you there. Take a breath. I'm going to go pay my bills again, and then I'm going to come back. He's going to deal with the issue of power lines. I'm going to give you one more question. Fair enough. Thank you. All right, you hang in there. All right, we'll put him on hold. We're going to go to break. When we come back, we're going to issue, we're going to answer the question relating to the power lines that are proposed to be built or not. Even, they're only one third, uh, is what Bruno is charging and what the industry standard, uh, actually is. We're going to get a response from that. And of course, we want your questions as well. We're back right after this. Okay, very quickly, Bruno, we got you back, do we? Yes, we do. All right. Yeah. Hang in there one second. Okay, power lines, not up to industry standard. Uh, in fact, they're only about one third of the industry standard, uh, which lowers your cost but ups our risk. What, what do you say to that? Um, well, you know, first of all, MHI. Uh, I just wanted to correct something. They didn't suggest we design to a one in five hundred year, um, and uh, we're designing to a one in fifty year. And they're suggesting uh, you should look at a one in in one fifty. And the design standards, if you look at them, actually, the actual wording in the design standard, it does depend on the circumstances that you're faced with. So what we've done is that we've looked at our design and said, look, we've beefed it up in the right areas, and uh, and we're content that we have the reliability there. But I think the most important point here is what we're saying is that reliability, there's two elements to reliability, uh, Randy. The first element is uh, when the line, you know, a, a, an event happens that the line goes down. So um, it could be an ice storm, you name it. The second event is how long does it stay down? So I ask you this: If you, you know, if if your lines went down uh, four times in 50 years, um, or, or or 10 years, or five years, and stayed down for a second, would you rather that, or have a line go down once, and have it up for three weeks? And and our belief, we know from our people here, they they, they want the lights on. So mm-hmm. what we're saying is that if we're going to put more money, additional money into the into the design of our lines here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Our question is, do we put it in to beef up the line so that we have uh, less events over time, or do we put it into money, backup generation and such, to say that if it does go out, you're not going to see a flicker, or if, all you're going to see is a flicker and the lights are staying on. We're saying when we do that cost-benefit analysis, we're better off to put our money uh, into additional backup generation that will cover us off to keep the lights on. All right, very quickly, Bruno, uh, 30 seconds to ask another question if you've got one. Yes. Uh, or respond to that. There was a lot of confusion there, uh, but there's no time. Uh, MHI also says that a lack of an integra- AC integration study um, will uh, result in gas that may require additional transmission lines and standby generation. Uh, that will have uh, pose grave risks as well. Uh, most importantly, your rejection of co- uh, the conventional cost of service 
which is standard industry practice in the financing of, of this, in favor of the royalty trust agreement, extends the risk an unheard of 57 years into the future, Mr. Martin. If any of the issues that MHI has identified occurs, the future generation... Uh, uh, will be uh, uh, the uh, the rate payer will be stuck for those costs. The alternative, demand side management, that is giving people money to get them off electric heat and insulating their homes. Uh, BC Hydro says saves them three dollars for every one. Instead of risking the rate ten billion dollars on the rate payers uh, money, why aren't you giving them money to reduce their costs every year? It seems to me that uh, since uh, this uh, with this unconventional funding model that this really just amounts to a hidden tax going to your only shareholder that is the province of Newfoundland and Labrador when the alternative aggressive demand side management that Newfoundland and Labrador is way behind on would provide a cost saving month after month after month to ratepayers all Why right are let's you risking let's the future so, when so, you uh, can all right, right, Bruno. All yeah. right, we've got, we've got. I think we've got the question here. Demand side management, obviously, um, and that would reduce costs significantly as well as as well as our consumption. How do you respond? Um, so I'm going to back up first. I mean, uh, you know, Bruno's asking a bunch of questions there. Um, a couple I can address fairly quickly. One he mentioned about uh, we haven't done an, an AC integration study. That's incorrect. Um, prior to Decision Gate 2, we had enough information to make our decisions. We have completed uh, an AC integration study, as we always said we would before Decision Gate 3. So that's done, and uh, we know the results of it. And uh, I just want to make sure listeners understand that uh, everything's fine from that perspective. It's, it is as we, as, as we thought. The second... Uh, from a from demand side management perspective, look, we're always interested in demand side management. All that means is conservation. That's all. And obviously, if we can get people to conserve more, everyone's going to win. Uh, you know, we have programs in place. We're working with Newfoundland Power with, re, with, re, with respect to that, and we'll always do that. It's a great thing to do. Even if we're linked up uh, with the Muskrat Falls side of things, if we save power ourselves, that's only going to free up more power that we can probably get some value for to bring back to the people of Newfoundland. So we couldn't agree, um, you know, more that that's an important facet. We do know, however, that for the, for what we're talking about, um, with respect to uh, a replacement of Holyrood and uh, and future demand, is that that is not going demand side management is not going to deliver the amount of power reductions that we need to cover off our future needs. We know that. So that so once again we're going to focus on it, but we know it's not enough uh, to cover off what we need with respect to that. So I just want to make that point. By the way, what would it? What would it? If you've done that exercise at all, the question that I posed here last week uh, at one point was: uh, Is it possible for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador to reduce their demand by fifty percent? Are you saying that in actual fact that's not possible? That if you actually had a, a full court press, you could reduce our demand by how much? Would yep. we even have a number? Um, we, studies have been done, and uh, you know, uh, we, you know, I guess we anchor to places like maybe British Columbia or places that have been at this for for decades, for many many years. Yeah. Looking at the types of numbers they're getting, um, frankly, I can't quote one right now, Randy, because it's not jumping into my mind the numbers. But I will say this: we've looked at it close enough to know what what, what places like that have put into it. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get the numbers, even if we do what we have to do uh, over time. It, it would take, you know, you're talking 20 or 30 years. They've been into it. We're not we're not going to get the numbers that are going to, you know, that are going to be able to cover off what we need from a demand perspective long term. Come back to the point, though, to say we're still dedicated to it because no matter which option we're in, it's a benefit. If we're in an isolated island option, it's a benefit. It's a benefit. And if we have excess power, it's a benefit. It's a benefit if we have excess power, if we create excess power. So we are going to be going hard at it. But it's not going to affect, uh, you know, the decision of either or in this particular case. But that doesn't mean we're closing our eyes to it. We're going to drive hard in either case. It's a very important piece of it. We have a huge demand here this morning as well. Some people wanting to get through to you. We have folks on the line, some of them waiting for a while. We are going to get to you. We've got to go. Hang in there, Jerry, for sure. And Lauren and Reg. I see Gavin Will is on there. Barry is on there. We want you on there as well if you have a question this morning for uh, Mr. Martin. When we come back from the news, we're going right back to the phone. Stay with us. And we are back, and of course we have Mr. Ed Martin, CEO of Nalcor, with us this morning, talking about all things energy, in particular Muskrat Falls. We're going to go right to the phones. We're going to say a very good morning here uh, to Reg out in Hare Bay. Good morning, Reg. Good morning, Randy Sims. How are you this morning? I am well, sir. How are you doing? Good, good, and good morning to Mr. Ed Martin. Good morning, Reg. Good morning. Now, first of all, uh, i got to say, Randy... A controversy, boy, I tell you, I thought the seal on, uh, was on the front line when it comes to controversy, but I, I'm beginning uh, 
to take a back stand. No, no, this one takes the cake, buddy. I guarantee you, my son, because I tell you, now we're talking some big dollars here. Now, when you get up to $6.2 billion, I mean, we're not talking chicken feed, so... But all I've been hearing, you know, is is what? How can I put it? More talks, more deadlines, more debates. And I tell you, people are more confused out here in my neck of the woods than ever, and including myself. Mm -hmm. And I heard you mention the word there a minute ago, uh, to see all on look bleak. I guarantee you, my friend, I'm very optimistic about the see all because I think it will come back strong and will survive. And I tell you, there's some people I would say now has got some skepticism about and bleak when it comes to the Mustrap Falls. Well, if there was one, if there was one piece of information that Ed Martin could give you this morning to uh, maybe clear up the confusion that you feel is out there, or would satisfy something for you on this issue, if there was one question and one answer, what would the question be? Well, I, I tell you now, Randy, I had two questions for Mr. Martin uh, this morning, and I was going to leave because you got a busy uh, show there. Yep. I was going to ask you. All right. I, I heard, and I just heard I mentioned too, 12, somewhere around 12, between 12 and $15 million a month. I've heard the figure thrown out there. My question is, is it true that we're, the government is spending, and according to my information, $1.8 million uh, on this project, and I'm going. To, my second question. You mean is, one point one point eight billion? Uh, yes. No, a million a, a month. One point eight, whatever they were talking. Oh no, they're spending about fifteen million a month. Uh, fifteen. Okay. Yeah. And the next question is, and uh, <laughs> this is a toughie. I wonder if the great Danny Williams was still in power today and 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 uh, behind the helm. I'm, I'm wondering, would this project uh, would have already had the green light and we've been good to go and like the fellow would say, we'd be off to the rodeo? Because like we said, uh, I, I'm optimistic and I think just got to go. It's, it's a must. I'm an equipment operator and I'm looking for a job, so the, the faster it gets on the go, the better I like it. And there's a lot of fellows out the same as me, so I'm going to leave it at, at this. You've got a lot of calls. So you have a good morning. I'll let Mr. Martin now respond to them a couple of questions. Thank well, you. all right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Reg. Very good. Okay. Well, first of all, Reg wants a job. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, and second of all, I guess, yeah, we can confirm, right? It's around 15 million a month that's actually being spent right now as they move from decision gate two processes through to decision gate three processes. And that's including like the $50 million contract with SNC Lavin and all that. The, the payouts for all of that are included, right? Right? That's absolutely correct. And by the time, let's say, this thing actually, you know, you cut a ribbon or you you blow up a rock or whatever you do to say, this is launch day, go ahead day, from the from the start to there, somebody already asked for a financial statement. You say that can actually be done, and it will come in, you figure, to be about 5%? Approximately, yes. So around $350, $400 million? That's correct. Is where it's going to be? Pro approximately. Well, that's, that's about it. All right. Yes. Okay, now... Reg wants an opinion. If Danny Williams were the Premier, would this already be done? Um, you know, we have to do a certain amount of work. We said we did from the start. Whether, you know, whoever who has been at the helm, uh, you know, obviously Premier Dunderdale was the Minister of Energy at the time. Uh, when Premier Williams was there, the, the message has been consistent then. It's consistent now. We need to go through a, 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 a decision gate process, a clear process to get to a point, a decision gate three, that people understand the numbers that are there at the time, the risks so associated with it, and the comparisons. That's what we're doing. No change. Um, I, I will go on to say I was thinking about your question to try to uh, you know try to simplify this a little bit uh, for uh, for Reg in terms of, of what uh, you know something they could look at and and, um, and and try to understand what's happening here. But I like to look at it from this perspective. Um, we're comparing the alternatives. We see Muskrat Falls as the low cost alternative. We're going to verify that. Period. Once we do that, the question then becomes: Do you want to spend um, seven eight billion dollars? in fuel costs over the next 30 years, paid out to oil companies that are not part of Newfoundland and Labrador, going offside our shores, and that's more money than you pay for Muskrat Falls. You're, and your alternative being you can pay this money in Muskrat Falls, you can build an asset that we own, we'll own forever. It's a 100-year-plus asset. Uh, you know, what's your preference? Do we want to put out money that we have nothing to show for at the end of the day, or do we want to put money into something that we have less money into something that we have forever, Muskrat Falls? It's almost like a rent versus buy decision. Uh, you know, if someone goes up to you and says, look, you can rent, but it's going to cost you more in the next 30 years, 
or you can buy, and it's going to cost you less, and you're going to have an asset at the end. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And once we uh, ascertain in terms of the differences between the alternatives, and one is cheaper than the other, and you own the asset at the end of the day, we know that's going to be a good investment. And, of course, your argument, months. obviously, is we can complicate it how, however we want with transmission lines, water flows, the energy subs, whatever we want, but it comes down to a simple... You're saying it's as uncomplicated as that in the end. Exactly. We are going to go now to line number two. We're going to say a very good morning here to Mr. Jerry Skinner, of course. Uh, and uh, I think everybody knows uh, Jerry pretty well these days. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. You got a question for Mr. Martin? Yes. Uh, I had two points I could make uh, pretty quickly. Uh, first of all, Ed, uh, mm. I would... Uh, I would say if there if there was an alternative to provide energy for Newfoundland that didn't uh, that took pressure off Newfoundland Labrador Hydro, uh, obviously there wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be any need to proceed with a, a project like this. And uh, I'd like to know what your opinion is of uh, if the government of Newfoundland provided an incentive to commercial clients and government agencies and residential across Newfoundland to proceed and uh, install some sorts of renewable energy systems uh, at their homes, businesses, agencies, universities, etc. Uh, this, th this incentive would encourage this to proceed and this is what every other uh, corner of the earth is doing right now and, and that way it takes a lot of pressure off the government. It also generates a new industry which uh, we seem to be not taking advantage of here and is certainly working and improving in every other corner of the world and across Canada. All right, let's see, if it, let's see if I understand the question just very quickly here. You're talking about if the government bit the bullet, did some incentives to consumers that encourage them to establish their own systems and also the conservation piece, would that not take the pressure off the demand side and would that make would that not make the development of a thing like Muskrat Falls unnecessary for the foreseeable future? Is that the question that yes, I'm getting out of your uh, statement? It, 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 yes, uh, they, that is the, qu uh, the question and it, it certainly happened in other places and all we need is 20 percent of the 2,000 megawatts over a five-year period or so, and, and then there would be no no requirement for uh, Holyrood or Muskrat Falls. All right, let's let's get Mr. Martin's response to that. That's an interesting concept. Well, uh, you know, uh, I mean, let's take an example. If I look at Ontario, what's happened in Ontario recently, uh, you know, they've gone into a green energy uh, program. They have uh, pumped a tremendous amount of uh, of those types of incentives into developing green energy. And what we're seeing uh, happening uh, now is we're seeing the government in Ontario pulling back from those things. They're making adjustments to it. Uh, they're seeing the price of energy uh, continuing uh, to rise significantly because of those types of things. And, uh, and we're saying, you know, from an incentive perspective, in terms of incentivizing, uh, let's put that aside for a second. Let's make this a pure business decision first. And if we put the true costs of these things, uh, you know, of either options in place without incentivizing either and, and make the comparison, is still a low-cost option, uh, you know, that we need to choose for the long run. And uh, incentivizing either of those things either way is not the way you want to make the business decision. Okay, incentives is not the way you got to go. You got to do it business. Uh, you got to do the business case and then compare it dollar for dollar and outcome to outcome. A second question on this, Jerry. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, that is uh, that can be absolutely challenged 100% uh, uh, because of the fact the new industry that will be generated w would be would generate much much more income for the government than the incentive that they would provide. And in, in Ontario, and I'm very aware of it, they, they've seen some unbelievable industries uh, generated up there. And not only are they doing business in Ontario, because these plants they have right now are actually selling and becoming the, uh, the number one supplier globally for solar power uh, manufacturing and, and quality products. All right, sir. That's really after taking off big time up there. So the second question I had was uh, that, uh, you know, given the fact that this is a, a big investment and a risk uh, to some degree, why would the government not just uh, put it on tender and agree to purchase power from a person, a company, a big company who could do this on their own, and then you could name a price that you want to get, uh, you want to pay for it, and uh, that way there's no there's no risk to the government, no cost to the taxpayer. You just buy the power as you need it, when you need it, if you need it. 
Why did we not do a public-private uh, partnership deal, or why didn't we just let it go to the private market to do? Thank you, Jerry. We'll end there, and we'll get Mr. Martin to answer that. That's, a, that's interesting, because an awful lot of people feel that we probably should have done just that. If it's a good deal and it's so attractive, why wouldn't we let business uh, take the lead? Uh, first off, uh, we are business, and we are taking the lead. Uh, but the second thing, and probably more importantly, um, this is a big job. Uh, we need expertise to do it. There is some risk attached to it. There's no question about that. We've been clear on that. There's an easy way to solve this. Uh, we've done it before. It's called Upper Churchill. So no problem. Let's get someone in, take all the risk, uh, build a thing for us, give us a return. It's not just going to be a return. That uh, is going to be a you know, non-risk return. It's going to be very small. And let someone else do this job, uh, take the profits, get the upside, get the long-term benefits out of it, and let all the benefits flow to a company uh, either owned by an outside entity or owned by shareholders, not Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Easy way to do it. Uh, from my perspective, no. Uh, we're in a different situation here. Uh, we have um, developed our expertise here, uh, you know, over the past uh, 15 or 20 years with major projects. Uh, we've hired most of those people. We know how to do them. We've been successful on them. Uh, for the first time in our history, uh, we have oil revenues, and we know of the last three deals that we've done with Hibernia South, uh, White Rose Extension, and Hebron, uh, estimates are we've brought in uh, an additional $40 billion over the next 35 years to be able, you know, in addition to the the, the other revenues that we have. Um, you know, as I said, we have the expertise. Uh, it's our time here now. We have the well-educated population. We have uh, an opportunity here that is low cost. We have an, op- we have a, we have an arrangement for the first time uh, with Nova Scotia and, and the mayor with respect to uh, selling our excess energy. And we look at this thing as step one in a much broader development uh, of this province. I mean, this is not just Muskrat Falls at this point. We've been clear in the energy plan from the outset. This is step one. Phase two is Gull Island. We have other small hydro we certainly expect we're going to develop over time using these kinds of lines that we've developed. The wind developments are going to continue. We, need, you know, we, we've looked at this as a Muskrat Falls, uh, you know, decision for low cost power, and it works. But stand back and say, let's look at the broader picture. For the first time in our history, we have the op- opportunity to be number one in the country. We have the opportunity to develop. We're developing routes out, and uh, and you know, looking at it from the bigger picture, I believe we're ready, and it's our time. And if people don't believe that, I guess that's a different viewpoint. I believe it is our time, and we do have the expertise, and we should take the profits from that and do it and keep it in Newfoundland and Labrador. All right. We have to uh, – Lauren, you with me? Yes, sir. All right. got to hang in there for another minute. I know you've been there for a while, but you got to hang in there for another minute. i got to go pay the bills again. That's good. All right. You stay there. We're coming back to speak to Lauren right after these messages. Okay. We are back, and we are going to go say good morning to Lauren. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning, Randy. How are you? Good. You have a question for Mr. Martin? Yes, sir. Indeed, I do. Morning, Mr. Martin, a few short years ago, sir, uh, uh, Clyde Wells was the premier of the province, and anyways, uh, he was thinking about selling Newfoundland Hydro to Newfoundland Power. Newfoundlanders went hell of a loop. And you know what a pity is? What a pity it got knocked down, because I'm sure they could do a way better job than what we're having done now. Because whatever way you turn, like you just said a few minutes ago, our power is going to go up probably another 40 to 50 percent by 2017 or 18, and uh, and you know it's already gone up 37 percent in the last four or five years. Huh? So you know you keep adding, adding, adding all the time. So you're going to put us back, going to put people back to the way they were back 40 or 50 years ago. Everybody just had a little bit of heat in their kitchen. Mm, how, and, so? And, uh, how, how so? How so? Well, nobody's going to be able to afford to turn on a heater. Oh, but that's where you are anyway, then. What do you mean, the firm at? Right, that's where, you're, well, you know, let's let's just very quickly, I understand you're trying to frame a question here, and I want to give you a chance to do it. But, yes. But aren't we in a position where, uh, let's take what Mr. Martin is saying at face value, uh, that in actual fact, if you're paying $200 today in 2018, yes. you're effectively going to be paying 280 Yeah. Now, you're going to be paying 280 whether that electricity coming to you is being generated at Holy Root through burning oil, or whether it's being generated through Muskrat Falls because we're running, we're running uh, water over the turbines there. Listen, Randy, so, so Randy, if there's no, if, but if there's no difference, if there's no difference in the price in that reality, how can you say that what they're going to do is set you back forty years? That's the there's there's where I'm missing your connection. Well, we're we're back we're back forty years right now. But you oh, know, okay, we're already uh, there. You're saying um, a farmer, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Roger Grimes, he had a deal down with Quebec. I'm sure his deal wasn't all that bad, where we could buy power for five, five cents a kilowatt, I think it was. It, it would turn back $800 million a year, 
to the province. Probably that's not a lot of money in some of these odds, but uh, our power rate will be very, very stable. And, I mean, I don't see why. This, this muskrat fall has got me shoved down our throats. You know, because, I mean, that's how it's been done. All because of a few uh, people that are, who are very greedy, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, that, that's all I'm saying. I'd like to ask Mr. Martin, did he ever look at the deal that Roger Rons had on the table? All right, we'll do that. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. Did you ever look at that deal and, and, and where it would have gone? Uh, a couple of points first there I just need to address. Um, you know, Lauren had mentioned about rates uh, have gone up uh, over the past uh, several years. Yes. And um, he's talking about, uh, you know, Newfoundland Power versus Newfoundland Hydro, who could do, who could do uh, a better job with respect to that. But I think we need to be clear, is that, you know, Lauren, what's driving those rates is something that is beyond the control of anybody. And that's oil prices. And uh, over the, you know, any rates, the, the majority of rates that we've had increases on over the past five years has been directly related to the fact that uh, power from Holy Road requires oil. Oil prices have gone up, and that's what's driven the rate increases over the past four or five years. Uh, you also mentioned uh, or suggested uh, something to the effect uh, you mentioned the word greed or greedy or such. But uh, yes, I, I think we just need to step back for one second and remember that Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro and Alcor is owned by the province. It's owned by the province of Newfoundland. It's owned by you. So uh, whatever cash flows into Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro or flows into Nalcor actually flows to the people of the province. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's it's us together with respect to whatever descriptor we want to have in it. Uh, the money stays within the province one way or another because we're totally owned by the province and we act on behalf of the province. Uh, with respect, you mentioned, uh, you know, um, uh, the previous arrangements uh, with respect uh, to Mr. Grimes. I, I can't comment on those, frankly, Lauren. I wasn't there uh, at the time. Um, you know, there wasn't an agreement, uh, you know, in place, obviously. Um, we've moved on, so there's nothing really I have to offer with respect to that. It's just not something that uh, that I'm into. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, does that answer any of it? I guess it doesn't because it it, it still leaves the question begging. That's a still a big question there, and uh, and uh, and uh, maybe maybe we'll have to leave this back to Randy and Randy have Mr. Ryan back on the airways again, so he can explain it all to Newfoundland because. Uh, but I but really but, uh, but I will say this, Lauren. Uh, yes. You know, a couple of simple points though. Um, I don't believe you're looking at apples and apples in any event. Uh, my understanding at the time is that uh, Mr. Grimes was uh, working with Gull Island. Yes. And the power from and, and the arrangements there. Yeah, the uh, full. They were doing the full meal lo the, the full meal deal on the lower Churchill, or that that's was right. their, that's what they were attempting. Well, to well my understanding was Gull Island, and they were yeah. selling the power, uh, you know, through Quebec to Hydro Quebec. Yeah. So I understand that part of it. Yeah. In this in this situation, we have, uh, you know, as as we've noted, this is uh, first and foremost an internal Newfoundland Labrador decision where we're using Muskrat Falls to provide power to the people of the province. So two fundamentally different uh, perspectives. I will say that, and you know, we have we we have done this with respect to uh, this is the lowest cost alternative for Newfoundland and Labrador first right uh, even with with respect to no ex external sales and the decision too has been well with the external uh, with, with the excess power we have the potential for external sales let's go after that well, so there are fundamentally two different things happening here yeah how, how can you say the lowest cost option if if Quebec was satisfied to come in and do go along we just buy the power from them so I'll take a profit out of it and, and at least the people not at least people be able to stay in their homes and stay warm you know, I mean, I got nothing against Muscat Falls. There's nothing wrong with Muscat Falls, but it's just too damn expensive, huh? And that's all too. I mean, people people cannot afford this. You know, I mean, and 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 regard to regard to saying it's forty or fifty percent, who's to say the way everything's going? It's going to be up. It's probably going to be up a hundred percent more. Okay, and, Lauren, I'm gonna Lauren, I'm, I'm gonna end you there because I'm gonna get him to respond to something you just said, which is uh, which which I think is intriguing, and 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 I'd like to get you to respond to it, Mr. Martin, to comment. Uh, and then we're going to let Lauren go on the issue okay. of, you know, how can we ever argue that Muskrat Falls is the lowest cost option when the lowest cost option was to have somebody else build it, generate the power, sell them the power, and take away the profit? And that's what he's talking specifically about, I'm, I'm assuming, either the Grimes deal or, or a deal with Hydro-Quebec. Why wouldn't we have done a deal on the marketplace that saw the thing built uh, and, and, and selling energy to others in the world, and we're pocketing profits instead of having to pay the capital. That, that's that pretty well it, Lawrence? Lauren, that, that's the comment? Okay, thank you, Lauren. Okay. You know, how, how can we ever argue that Muskrat Falls is the lowest cost option if we apply 
that kind of criteria to it. Now, it might not be comparing apples to apples, fair enough, but, you know? To, to me, it's, um, it's pretty simple, really. Um, so if we, uh, you know, we are here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Newfoundland portion of the province is an island, so we need power. We know we need more power. So you sit back and say, forget everything else. What are we going to do to provide power? We have to keep the lights on. And we're, so, so we, look, we looked at all of those options. We boiled it down to you leave the island uh, separate, not connected, and that's going to lead us down a certain path with respect to importing uh, fuel to cover most of our costs, in addition to some small hydro and other things. Or we develop Muskrat Falls and bring a Labrador Island link to the island to provide power for ourselves, period. Those two options, Muskrat Falls, Labrador Island Lake, is the lower cost option to do that. Wasn't the third option, though, to look at the lower Churchill in relationship to the asset we have at Upper Churchill and say, is there a deal out there in the marketplace that gets this developed for us? We get recall power for our own use, which we need, and we sell the rest of it and make money? So, so the rest Wouldn't of me, that have been the lowest cost option? Um, we're not a charity here, okay? So we go to someone else and pick a Quebec. Uh, so we go to Quebec and we say we want to buy some. Our power. natural partner would have been Hydro Quebec. So we say we want to buy some power from you. So let's just get that. I mean, let's just be real here. We go to Hydro Quebec and they say we want to buy some power from you, and uh, they say okay, what do you want? We say X amount, and they say okay, and uh, and I say to them I want that for this price because it's really cheap for us. It's cheaper than Muskrat and everything else. And they're going to say, oh, um, yeah, that's nice, uh, but we're not in the charitable mood today. What we want is money that we could get elsewhere for that power. We're not going to give it to you for less than we can get it elsewhere. And they say, oh, yeah, well, I guess you're probably right. So we looked at what they could get for it elsewhere in the market. We compared that to Muskrat Falls. Muskrat Falls is cheaper. So why would we pay something it's more? Cheaper, it's, che it's, it's cheaper on a kilowatt-hour basis, you're arguing, or it's cheaper even after you calculate capital and throwing in $6.2 to get this deal done? It's still cheaper than... Just look at a pure fuel. Just look at a pure purchase. We can either build Muskrat Falls, turn it into a PPA, which we've done. Yeah, that's a power purchase agreement. Power right? purchase agreement, or we can do a power purchase agreement with, with Quebec for what they could get for it elsewhere. We compare those two. Muskrat Falls is the better option. In both options, you're still building a link to the island. Yes, so you've got you to discount you gotta have that. that anyway. You've got to so, discount that. Yeah. So if you want to do that, you compare the, the cost of generating power at Muskrat Falls versus the cost of what a Hydro Quebec could get for it elsewhere. We've done that analysis. Muskrat Falls is the better option. So why would we go out and pay even, even more to Hydro Quebec when we have a cheaper option here? Or I'm going to go to Hydro Quebec and say, how about giving us a discount on what you can get elsewhere, old pal? They've been so great to us for the past 40 years. That won't be a problem for them to give us a better rate than they can get <laughs> elsewhere. They're really going to do us yeah, a favor. Okay, yeah, I mean, was, come on. You know? There's no discounts there. Uh, to, yeah, we, we so, know so I think it, right. it is a pure business arrangement, and uh, and we've looked at that, and this is the better option. Well, we are going to go to break, and when we come back, we're going to continue. We want to talk with you. Stay with us. Okay, we are back, and where are we headed here? I've got to go down the line. Oh, we're going to go to line number five and say a very good morning here to Mr. Gavin Will who is a publisher of Boulder Productions. Good morning, Gavin. Oh, good morning, Randy. And how are you doing this fine day? I am well, sir. You got a question or a comment for Mr. Martin? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, before I uh, became a, uh, a publisher, I was a, uh, a journalist, and I worked in the, uh, in, the, in the energy sector. It was a fascinating uh, period of my professional life. Yeah. I, just can't, I, just, I guess I just can't stay away. So I, I wanted to get some... To, uh, to your last comment, I thought, I, I, Randy, to you, your last comment about uh, the Upper Churchill, uh, and uh, I think that uh, that in, in all this debate about Muskrat Falls, we really kind of lost sight of the proverbial uh, elephants in the room, which is uh, the Upper Churchill uh, project. And, um, and while it is true that uh, Quebec uh, got a, you know a, a pretty uh, sweet deal out of the original contract. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that that contract is up for renewal in 2041, which is uh, 29 years from now. Right. And uh, by the time the, the Muskrat Falls project is completed, and I presume it's going to get completed because uh, because Nalcor and, and his government seem to intend on ramming it down our throats whether we like it or not, that it'll be there'll be 24 years. Now, I just uh, uh, and the, one of the latest, uh, I just had a look at one of the latest power contracts that uh, Hydro Quebec signed. This was with the state of Vermont. It was a 26 year power contract. This was in 2010. Now, when, this power, uh, when, when Muskrat Falls comes on, on board, that's 24 years. That means that, uh, that Hydro Quebec, as of 2017, will have only 24 years left. 
And I, and I just heard Mr. Martin say that, oh my God, you know, it's just, you know, Hydro Quebec is basically, uh, isn't going to give us, uh, us any deals. Well, the fact of the matter is that this con- that the Upper Churchill Fall- Falls power contract is going to be coming up for, for renewal in 25 years. They are going to want to negotiate before the end of that agreement because they won't be able to sign a long-term contract with their U.S. customers unless they do. So my question to Mr. Martin is, has, uh, why have, not, uh, have they not uh, d- uh, uh, tied this, uh, basically, begun negotiating? Well, perhaps they have. Perhaps they've already begun uh, negotiating uh, with, uh, with Hydro-Quebec uh, on the Upper Churchill Power, Power Project. So why haven't they opened up negotiations uh, now, tied the Lower Churchill to it, yeah. and had those discussions long before the expiration of the Upper Churchill contract in 2041? That's right. Interesting question. Let's let's uh, ask Mr. Martin, uh, Is that was that not a strategy considered, or was that not a good plan, or why was it not done? Uh, it, uh, it obviously uh, has been done. I mean, we have been very clear. We've been in, uh, you know, into Quebec looking for open access um, through Quebec into Ontario, New York, New England. Um, that they've uh, they've uh, they fought us on that. Uh, we are in courts over uh, how that's going to turn out, and we'll continue yeah, to still. pursue that. We're, we're still, still we're still in court over that. Um, but once again, stand back one second again and take a look at what we're talking about. I mean, we need to be properly positioned. Uh, for a discussion in 2041. I mean, that's critical here. For, for too many years, we've been sitting at the table, hat in hand, saying, what do you think? And uh, you go into a negotiation anywhere in this world, and you go in without any leverage, without any knowledge about what you know, about where you want to go, and basically saying, what can you give me? I think I know where the answer is going to be, and that's, that's likely why we've been sitting on, uh, on on these developments for 40 years. Now we're in a situation, uh, you know, I, say, I send back and say, okay, let, let's take a look at something. First off, Forget all of that. Newfoundland and Labrador needs power. What's their low-cost option? Is Muskrat Falls? That works for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, excess power. Now we have a route that we're building into in through to Nova Scotia, and uh, and basically we're we're serving notice to the rest of the country. Uh, no question about it that that works for us. But now you look at the map. Uh, instead of Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland being se- separate and alone, we have a link coming down from Labrador, coming all the way through Newfoundland and on through to Nova Scotia. We have a loop. For the first time, um, that, that's number one. Number two is 2041 is, as you mentioned, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, if uh, you know, obviously in Quebec situation, they have to be saying that's 20 percent approximately of their power mm-hmm. in in Quebec. So it's a big hunk of their power, and they have to be looking at that now as well. Certainly they are, and saying what happens in 2041 because if for some reason we decided to do something uh, somewhat different with the Upper Churchill then they would have to, uh, they'd obviously have to start looking at how they're going to replace 20% of that power. That could be a series of power plants, could be a series of things, but that's going to take a while to build, so the time frame is closing. Um, so we sit back in that context and say, now we have Gull Island there, uh, which, is a, which is an absolute jewel. It's a, it's a beauty of a development, there's no question about it. And, uh, and for my money, I think uh, we're, in a, we're, in a, we're in a good position, because we've done Muskrat Falls, we have another link established, it may not cover everything we need for gold. I admit that, but we've established a link. We've established that we can do these things. Twenty um, percent of the power is coming up. Uh, we're going with gold. is sitting there, uh, still ready to go. And now, when we go to the table, uh, in terms of uh, we've built it, we have, uh, as I said, we have revenues that we uh, from the oil business uh, that are going to sustain us for a period of time. Uh, they know we can build these things. They know we can. We have the ability to go around, and we sit down with Hydro Quebec now, and and I'm saying that's going to be a good thing. Uh, we've dealt with Hydro Quebec for 40 years, good, bad, or indifferent. We'll deal with them again. Um, it's just a business arrangement. But if you look at what we have uh, here right now in this context, uh, when we sit down at the table with them, I think there's going to be an eye-to-eye conversation, and uh, and I think it's going to be interesting how that develops. And we'd certainly be prepared to deal with 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 a Hydro Quebec or anybody. It's a business deal we need. We just need the right one. On that note, uh, Gavin, we're going to move on. Any final question? Very quick final thought. Well, I just think that uh, that we that perhaps uh, we're actually weak in our position in in some respects. Right now, we do have all the aces. Uh, well, of course, every day that passes, we gain more uh, uh, more leverage. And by building this infrastructure now, which is which is limited, as uh, as, uh, as Mr. Barton has just pointed out, we actually are are, are weak in our, our head in some respects. Uh, you know, we. We could be negotiating with Quebec, uh, Quebec now on a comprehensive, you know, uh, kind of uh, Labrador, Newfoundland, Quebec power arrangement. 
And, uh, but instead, we're going to be uh, paying $7 billion for something that may not actually meet our needs, you know, with, when the, uh, in 10, 15, 20 years from now. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely going to meet our needs. I mean, that's what the demand for We have a need. Uh, demand forecast uh, indicates that we have a need for power. This will meet our need for power. And it's also, uh, in addition to all that for the island, it's also creating, uh, you know, additional surplus energy for use in Labrador for the mining developments. Uh, all right, we're going to, and, and we're going to speak to that as well. We, we've got to go to break on that note. Gavin Will, good to talk with you, buddy. Very nice talking with you, too. Take care. Uh, Have a great day. Bye bye. All right. Interesting questions being asked this morning and interesting challenges. Got a question here, Ed Martin, when we come back. Uh, I'm going to get you to jump on it just before we go to the phone. Uh, this comes in from Twitter. Can Ed Martin comment on the royalty trust financing option with Altius? And this is, of course, the fact that apparently the financing for Muskrat Falls is not going to be what one would consider standard or traditional. And I'm going to get you to, to take a moment to talk about that, okay? okay? We are back right after these important messages. Stay with us. All right, we are back. Where were we heading? I'm not really sure anymore. We are going to go, oh, up to Barry on line number one. Barry, good morning. Oh, just before we do that, Barry, hang on, buddy. Yep. I've got a question for you here uh, that we had to do this morning, and so we better, we better deal with it just before I get to you, Barry. What's this, what's this royalty trust agreement versus traditional financing? What are we talking about when people ask about that? Um, it, was, it, was, it was new to me uh, in terms of when that came up, and, um, and I tried to do some research into what's happening there. So I think, I think what we have here is a situation. Let me say first off, there is no royalty trust agreement with Altheus. There's no offer of financing from Altheus. There's nothing to that. Uh, we're doing a traditional financing as our strategy at this point. Okay, so where did this story all come from? Where does this all come from? I think where it came from, uh, and I'm only speculating, but I look back uh, to 2003 or so. Uh, I wasn't there at the time, uh, but uh, there had been a request for proposals that had been asked for um, by, um, uh, you know, to develop the Lower Churchill. Right. And several had come in to do the actual development, and a couple had come in to do uh, to some financing arrangements. Uh, right. One, uh, Altis was involved in one of those, and a royalty trust arrangement they had suggested, and uh, there was another group, I forget who they were, um, but both of those financing proposals were said, okay, I understand, they, put it, they were put aside uh, to say, we're not even talking about financing yet, let's, let's look at the development. Right. And, and then decisions were made to go a certain way, and really there's, it has been looked at ever since. Right. It's not part of the financing uh, that we're looking at right now, and it's not, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not anywhere near what we're trying to achieve. So financing here, traditionally, you're going to the world, you're, go, you're going to the world banks, you're going to... Yeah, so, so just very quickly, again... Uh, you're borrowing the money. Exactly, and what we do, uh, we, we put our plans together, uh, you know, we, we have our financial advisors who have helped us with that. Uh, we're uh, getting the, the federal loan guarantee source it out and it will be there. Once we do that, then um, we go to an open bid process to select what we call a lead arranger. So it'll be a bid process and uh, clear and open, and we'll select someone. It'll likely be one of the banks. Uh, normally, is who the lead arranger is, and that will be done on a competitive bid. We'll get the lead arranger in. We'll design the program together, and then when we go to the market, the lead arranger usually takes a fair hunk of the financing because that's the benefit of being the lead arranger. But then he lays off a lot of the rest of the financing to other banks, and, and, and so he, so they spread the risk around. And that'll be done on a you know on a on a market basis at that point. Uh, so right now we're looking at a you know at a traditional. Financing. Financing. Whoever comes in to take a piece of that uh, a piece of that financing afterwards, we'll approve that. We'll know who it is, but uh, primarily it's going to be arranged by the lead arranger to get us the best possible rates we can get. So very traditional financing. Uh, I will come back as well and say, uh, from a financial advisor perspective, which is a separate thing from a lead arranger. That's our own personal financial advisor. Right. When we bid that, we also did an open bid on that, and Pricewaterhouse Coopers won that. But part of our bid process at that point was to say, whoever wants to be a lead arranger on this financing. You can't be our advisor. So a lot of these big banks step back at that point because they want to bid on the on the lead arranger sure. business. So we ended up with still a good suite of folks, and that's how we ended up with Price Waterhouse Coopers, uh, you know, and uh, and access to their worldwide uh, financing expertise to advise us in Alcor on a day to day basis. So this royalty trust piece is. Uh, uh, references to a historical thing, if we want, for the want of a word, no practical application to what's happening today. Exactly. Lauren, we're going to you, sir, or Barry, we're up to you. Yes, sir. How All are you right. Doing today? Uh, good. I apologize for holding you back there on that, but you go right ahead now. I got a question uh, to Mr. Martin that I've probably never ever asked him. It should have been asked him, and um, and uh, I'm going to ask him now. Yep. Uh, um, there, uh, 
There has been uh, in the last few years now, as a, a few years has passed, uh, and uh, some young fellows uh, have uh, drowned at Muskrat Falls, right at the location. And uh, I want to know what uh, their their plans are uh, before development starts on uh, on uh, any kind of search efforts for the the, the remains of the two missing that uh, haven't been recovered uh, at that site. And uh, and uh, what uh, what their plans are? I spent six months of my own time uh, pushing uh, some uh, you know pushing for the resources for these families to uh, to try to recover their loved ones at that site. And uh, I spent a very difficult time with uh, you know with the family members uh, uh, trying to 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 uh, get them to find their their loved ones and and, and have some kind of closure here. So my question is, before any blasting, before anything happens at that site, what plans do NALCOR and the province have on searching that area before they continue with any kind of a project? Because uh, first and foremost, that's the only reason why I want this project to go ahead, uh, for to see if there, if there was any kind of a recovery there or if those young fellows could have been found there at that site before anything continues. Uh, my uh, my view on it is that uh, it's quite possible that uh, they're still around the loca- location there somewhere. Uh, the remains. Uh, I know it's not uh, something anyone wants to be talking about, but uh, you know those uh, people are still years past uh, in the grieving process, uh, in uh, uh, turmoil. And uh, mm-hmm. I just want to know what right. uh, what their future plans were for that. Okay, Barry, we got to give Mr. Uh, Martin uh, time to do that. Uh, before we go to news. Okay, thanks, Barry. Go uh, ahead. All right. Yeah, just uh, yeah, thanks for that, Barry, and, and, and good morning. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's a question I don't really have an answer to right now, Randy. It, it's, uh, you know, it's something I wouldn't want to jump into and speculate on uh, because uh, obviously we're dealing with families and people here and, and we yeah. have to be respectful. I, mm-hmm. uh, good question. Uh, rather than me jump in and speculate on something that I'm really not up to speed with and understanding the needs of the family, uh, maybe we could arrange to have a Barry call in. Uh, to Nalcor, and we can uh, put him in touch with the right people to start this thing out properly so that we understand the issue, he understands the issue, and, and I'm not just speaking off the cuff uh, with, with uh, you know, with, with something I'm not really that familiar with at this point. Not an aspect of anything associated with this particular project you've ever had to take a look no, at. No, and, and if I speculate on, you it's know. It's kind of outside the. It, it, it kind of is outside, and, uh, you know, and, and I don't, you know, I don't want to speculate on what could have happened to those unfortunate people and those types of things. I don't understand, uh, you know, how the river flow and how those things would happen. So really it's something rather than disrespect the families or Barry. It's, it's, we'd be more than happy to talk to them offline on that and uh, put the right people in touch to make sure we got the facts and understand each other and know, and know, uh, and know what's happening before I just commented on it. Okay, all right. Uh, fair enough. Well, on that note, we are going to... Uh, uh Patrick, if we can, I think we're just going to try and scoot off a, a touch early to go to news. Is that okay? Is the newsroom prepared for that? Megan, everybody is okay with that, are they? Uh, we're going to run off about a minute early uh, to go to news because we can't we can get another question in or anything in this, pati- in, in this point of time. So we'll do that. We're coming back for our last half an hour. We've got uh, some questions lined up still, and we've got to get a little more rapid fire. <laughs> i got a feeling to try and get even more of this in if we can, Ed, before we, uh, we actually end up at 1130. All right, stay with us. We're going to be back right after the news, hopefully with your question for Mr. Martin. We are back, going to line number four. Going to say hello to Annie. Good morning, Annie. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Annie. Great show. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm all for having clean energy. A couple of questions, quick questions. Mm-hmm. Um, will this clean energy, when Muskrat Falls comes on stream, comes to the island and goes to Nova Scotia, will any of this clean energy be going to the homes uh, in Labrador? And uh, the second part is... As a resident of Newfoundland, uh, will I be paying more or less, do you think, for the power that I use in my home here than, say, our neighbors in Nova Scotia? Um, so t- two questions. The, f- the first question, Annie, um I just want to describe uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, there will be power available for homes in Labrador and Newfoundland. That's the first priority. Mm-hmm. And uh, it will also be available for industry in Labrador. Mm-hmm. Because what we've done here is that we've taken of the total Muskrat Falls output, um, 40% is uh, at, at the outset will be used for Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm-hmm. Uh, 20% uh, we're selling to Nova Scotia and establishing the link. Mm-hmm. And there's 40% left. 
Mm-hmm. And that 40% we are selling in uh, through uh, the Atlantic Canada and into New England. Mm-hmm. But, but we're selling that power on a spot market basis, as they call it, meaning that uh, I can, we can sell it every hour. We sell it every hour, and if we don't, uh, if we don't want to sell it the next hour, we don't have to. We pull it back in and use it for our own needs. So that, mm-hmm. so, so while we're waiting for an increased demand in Labrador or Newfoundland, mm-hmm. we're making money on that extra in, in, in the spot market. But if we need that power the next day, mm-hmm. we can bring it home. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm saying absolutely available for Newfoundland and, uh, and Labrador homeowners and also for Labrador demand uh, if uh, if and when the mines go, mm-hmm. we have the ability to pull that power back at any time. That's why we're not locking that extra power up into any type of long-term commitment. At this stage, we're waiting to see what develops in, uh, in Labrador. Uh-huh. As far as uh, more or less uh, uh, from a cost perspective, um, a couple of different answers there. In Labrador, uh, the rates in Labrador are different than they are on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, in Labrador... Um, it's a it's a it's a separate uh, it's a separate grouping under the uh, under the uh, PUB uh, d- d- distinctions. And Labrador gets power uh, at this point much cheaper uh, than the island does, and uh-huh. uh, that will continue uh, mm-hmm. in the event uh, of uh, of Muskrat Falls power being used in Labrador. The blend up there will still be less than the island of Newfoundland, and will still be less than uh, than what's being uh, sold for in Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. Um, with respect to the uh, island, uh, you know, rate payers, once again, we have done this on a standalone island perspective first, and it's the mm-hmm. cheapest option, so it's right for the island. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we go to Nova Scotia and we sold them a piece of this power uh, in exchange for the link and such, we have to look at their next best. Uh, they have the opportunity to replace, uh, you know, their next needs for power with other options, and that's yeah. as much as they will pay. Mm-hmm. And uh, so our choice then is to take that uh, offering, which is very, very, very uh, lucrative compared to what we could get elsewhere in the market, or take nothing. Mm-hmm. And we said, no, we'll take that because it's a very, very good price for power. Uh, it establishes the link, and it gets us into New England. So um, some of the power being sold in uh, in Nova Scotia will be, uh, honestly, at a less rate than, than Newfoundlanders will maybe be paying. But the question is, mm-hmm. what's our alternative? Do nothing with it, let it flow over the dam and get nothing for it, or while we're waiting to use it, uh, you know, let's establish a link and let's get some value for it until we need it. It's a hard piece of the sell, though, isn't it? To uh, say to somebody that we're going to f- fund this thing 100%, so you're going to pay I don't know how much. Why, what's that power going to be selling for once it gets to Soldier's Pond? What are we talking per kilowatt hour? Is it going to be 18 cents, 19 cents, 22? Uh, yeah. what, what is it? Uh, once again, Randy, you know, if I go there, uh, I tell you, it, it just doesn't make sense to people. Um, you know, it's uh, so, so, I mean, once I get into the kilowatt hour stuff, uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not explainable. So let me try to put it in a, in a different perspective. Um, so is there a number, though? Uh, Let's y- say you don't want to get into it, but get into yeah. it anyway. Is there a number? Yeah, yeah, yes, there is a number. We published those numbers before. And it's what? And 20, uh, 23, was it? No, 21? No, 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 no. no, no. Uh, back up for a second, and, and here we go. Yeah. You know, this is why I like talking about the bills with the people of the problem. Well, I appre- as I, soon as I, I get into this, people say, call me afterwards and say, Ed, will you tell me what my bill is, please? I, I you know? appreciate that. But no, no, I, I understand uh, kilowatt hours. Yeah, there's a there's a point at which I though, understand, you know, cost per kilowatt hour. That that's fairly sort of simple stuff. Yeah, so so roughly speaking, uh, you know, let me use rough numbers then to try to put it in perspective. Is that the Muskrat Falls will come into uh, into the system here? Uh, if you look at it uh, from uh, an equivalency to Nova Scotia, where you start off at a rate now and you escalate it over time. Mm-hmm. So you're in the uh, 14, 15 cent range, and uh, you know for initial sales in Nova Scotia, uh, for that same amount of power, you're into the uh, 9, 10 cent range, uh, mm-hmm. roughly speaking, for for that power. And I go back to say that the the power that uh, we're establishing with Nova Scotia, uh, you know, remember that that is much better than we can get in any other market right now. And our choice is not to make that particular sale or establish a maritime link. We're better off to do that, get excess cash for the uh, remainder of the power, and. Remember, you know, looking over time, this is a long-term arrangement. So people t- mm-hmm. tend to focus on what's happening on, you know, say June the first, 2017. Mm-hmm. But you look at the projections for power uh, over the next 50 years, and remembering that we get the benefit of that. So if prices go down or prices go up, there's risks associated with it. But for the first time in our history, we are the ones who are getting the benefit of that. So if the, if the price projections go where uh, where they're being projected to go over the next 30 to 50 years in New England uh, as well as Atlantic Canada, it's our power. We get the value for that. So you can't just look at this thing over what's uh, going to happen no, one day. No, I understand, but right. I'm a senior. Yeah, Many of Newfoundland and Labrador people are seniors. What we are most concerned with is... What will we be paying for power when Muskrat Falls 
comes on stream. Will it be cheaper for me to move to Nova Scotia because my power is going to be cheaper there? Or, hey, will I be able to afford my power bills and live in my home province? Okay, well. That, we that's the bottom line for me, and I think that's the bottom line for probably all of the other residential customers in Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you, Annie. We're going to get him. We, can, we have something that we can rely on, a clean energy that's not going to cost us uh, you know, more than we can afford to pay for the power bill. All right. Thank you, Annie. So I just follow up on that a little bit and say, that, yeah, thanks, Annie. And, and obviously, uh, especially the seniors, uh, we're all focused on that. We want to make sure that we, we provide the best option. So, so, so two points. One is that this is uh, a lower cost option than the alternative. So without doing this, whatever happens to, to bills, it would be worse if we don't do this. The second thing is, remember, we're taking this power and, uh, and, and we're, we're, we are blending it in naturally with the other assets that we have. And, and a good example is Beta Spare. Which is, uh, you know, uh, a 600 megawatt development that was done 30 or 40 years ago. And actually, you look back over the news clippings, you look back over the, the discussions and public debate that happened at the time, you could change, you could take out Beta Spear and you put Muskrat Falls in. It looked a lot like this. You wouldn't see any difference. <laughs> it's the exact okay. same thing. They built, they built power more than they needed at the time. Mm -hmm. There was a, there was a, there was a lot of public debate about it. It was done. And looking back at it now, we have a facility essentially paid off. And that's what's keeping our rates uh, competitive throughout, uh, very competitive at the country right now, like other hydro jurisdictions. So the exact thing with Beta Spare. But that being said, we have Beta Spare. Uh, we have several other hydro developments, Granite Canal, uh, other developments throughout the province. This is being blended in with those other developments. So it's not, uh, there, it's not that your rates are all going to be driven by Muskrat Falls. We're not on a marginal cost here for new, for new customers. We are blending those in, averaging it out. And when you compare that average cost, including Muskrat Falls, uh, with all of the other developments that we have at our disposal today, we will still be competitive across the country with respect to power rates. We are going to go and uh, very quickly say a very good morning here to Brad Cabana out in Saskatchewan. Hi, Brad. Good morning, Randy. Morning, sir. Yeah, I just had two quick points. The first one was a follow-up on what was said earlier about the royalty trust agreement. All right. And, I'm just, and I just quickly would ask Mr. Martin, is he speaking uh, on behalf of the government for their portion of the fundraising? And uh, will Altius have, or any entity controlled by Altius have, any uh, involvement in the financing of Muskrat Falls? Um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not speaking on behalf of the government, uh, but uh, we are, uh, in, in terms of our financial planning, uh, when we go and talk to the markets, when we go and talk to the credit rating agencies, and we go and talk to any financial advisor, we obviously take the Department of Finance along with us, uh, the experts there, because, uh, you know, we are intertwined. They, we, they are our shareholders, so they've been involved in all of our discussions. It will continue to be. It's, it's a smart thing to do. So from that perspective, we don't represent the government, but they're certainly there with us every step of the way and making sure that we both know exactly what's happening in the impact of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, from the Altius perspective, um, you know, uh, Brad, I just have to, I just have to say to you, I had, uh, you know, that came up, uh, someone mentioned it to me because there has been some, um, some of the, uh, the, what do you call the blog and Twitter stuff going on about that. And, uh, and I had to ask my people, I said, well, is there any, what, you know, what, what's being talked about here? And as I mentioned earlier, that was uh, something I think that had happened previous. We haven't looked at it for five years, six years. It's been put on a back shelf. I, I really wasn't aware of it. So, to my knowledge, um, and and with the you know, and and to the way we're moving right now, um, it just hasn't just not part of the financing arrangement. These kind of unique or innovative financial arrangements is not where you're going. You're you're going very much to a traditional means of financing a major project of this type. No question about it. And uh, you know, and 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 we have the you know as I mentioned, we have the lead arranger in place. This is all bid stuff. So whenever yeah. it comes forward as a finance, we're going to go for the cheapest financing. But this Altius thing, I uh, I can tell you, it's just not something that's been on on my radar screen at all. Coming out of nowhere. Coming, coming out, out of nowhere. Coming out of history. Uh, I have to say that. that Does that answer it, Brad? Well, um, you, you, yes and no. I mean, uh, what, what I'm what I'm wondering on that Altius is is that really didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of a proposal from Altius to then Premier Danny Williams, who said that of the three financing options, he was most intrigued by that particular option because it was a Newfoundland-based company. I've never and, heard. I've never. I've never heard of it or seen it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist now. And, but but Ed, you've never heard it or seen it. You're saying that's correct. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, my second question, uh, just quickly, is is that uh, Nalcor has done its projections for power consumption, if I'm right, for the next say 50 years, and, uh, and they basically projected out 50 years. Mm -hmm. 
if I'm correct. Uh, That's correct. Right now, right now there are 13 to 15 mining developments going on in Labrador, six by the Chinese, two by India. Uh, each one of those mines is going to use, a pro- you know, approximately 80 to 100 megawatts of power. I mean, we could easily see uh, 800 megawatts of power needed for mines in Labrador. And what I'm wondering on, on a business case is, is has Nelcor uh, taken that into account in its projections and that need for power? And if so, where's the power going to come from to run those mines? As uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Martin just said, uh, the cheapest power in, in all of Newfoundland and Labrador. Where's that 800 megawatts of power going to come from for those mines? All right. Thank, thank you, Brad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye bye. I think I know the answer already, but but you go ahead. Where's the where does the power come from? You've got these mines going to open up now. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. We certainly are looking at it. Yeah. And, um, you know, a couple of points again, just to lay the groundwork for the people, is that, uh, you know, first off, before we can uh, develop uh, anything with the mining company, we have to have a signed agreement with them in place. Mm-hmm. It's not something they can say, well, you build this for us and we'll, we'll probably go. No, we have to say, look, if you're going, let us know, and uh, and when you're ready, come up and sign something uh, with us, and we will then build something to make sure you get the power. Right. That's our job, and that's what we do. Mm-hmm. They haven't done that yet, although we're in discussions with them. And uh, you know, many that's of, coming. We have to assume that's have, coming. So assuming that's coming, I say we can't go and build for that right now, but assume that's coming. How are we going to handle it? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a couple of, uh, of, of potential arrangements, and, and just you know, to give the people the benefit of my thinking, the first thing we think, well, if if everything ever went that we ever could consider ever, could we do a goal? Because Gull, uh, if all of the power is used in Gull on a unit cost basis, uh, it's better than Muskrat on a unit cost, if every bit of power is paid for. Yeah. Muskrat's still a great unit cost project, but Gull would be better. The problem we have is that we are not using, you know, we don't have uh, anything uh, we, we can point to to say all the power will be used. Yeah, you don't have customers for it either. Exactly. Right? That, that, so at that point, point right? for the customers we have, Muskrat Falls is the lower unit cost because we'd have to put two or three more billion into, into Gull and we'd be sitting on three times the power with nowhere to go, going mm-hmm. over the dam. So from that perspective, uh, we said, no, Muskrat Falls is the best option for us now. But what happens if the developments go? Well, I just want to say to the people, remember, we still have the small hydros uh, here on the island. Uh, we still have wind opportunities. We still have recall available to us uh, from the upper Churchill that, is, that, that, that we can use. We also have potential developments in Labrador. A great one that... Uh, you and, know, of course, 40% of the power that you're proposing to sell into Nova Scotia and New England is... Is sitting there available to come back in a moment's notice. By hour, by hour, by hour. By hour, That's by hour. That's never locked down into a lockdown contract for anybody's use. Exactly. And we have that okay. available to us. So we're sitting on a situation where it is much better at this point with what we know and the risks that we have to take on is to do the lower cost capital project the muskrat and build on additional power to that with respect to the small hydros the wind if we need it uh, and um, and the, bring back the excess power uh, that we're selling elsewhere from muskrat falls we build up that profile and say that is something that is the lowest risk because we have the smaller capital project in muskrat and then we have all these other smaller developments we can work up to if the mining needs it when they need it we don't just build it all at one time and i look at that profile and i say uh, on the mix with that's a sensible profile for us where you know uh, that's something that is the lowest cost risk to be able to meet the demands in Labrador as opposed to say we did a gull now no contracts in hand all that power sitting up there someone changes their mind and what are we going to do with all that power and all the extra cost who's going to eat that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and I'm saying no that's too high risk to do that let's see let's save gull as I mentioned earlier as I call it the jewel and let's do this for ourselves. And then uh, when we sit with Hydro Quebec and others, at the right time, uh, Gull is sitting there still untouched, the jewel, and that's going to be the long-term revenue stream that is going to add to everything else we have here in the long-term Newfoundland and Labrador. We are going to go to break. We are back right after these messages. And we are back, and so we are going to go to line number three here. We're going to say a good morning to our caller there. Caller on line three, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am well. You have a question for Mr. Martin. I do, so how are you this morning, Mr. Martin? Good morning. Uh, I'll make it quick because we haven't got much time. Okay, the power we're going to bring back down, I, I'm guessing the main reason for this is because of the industry in Labrador now and, and the hydromatic plant and all the industry that's going on in the province. We're going to need the excess power. My question is, are these people, are their kilowatt hour rates going to be raised the same as the residential users here in the island, or are these people being given preference because they're bringing their business here? That's my number one question. Mm, that's a good, good little question, actually. The, yeah. Yeah, industrial rates versus residential rates. Yes, and the second part of it is, what about if em- EMRA doesn't approve the cable? 
what are we going to do with the power then? Now we're stuck with Quebec again because we got no way to get that power off the island. Okay, and what happens if the PUB or what happens if the Nova Scotia part of the deal gets scuttled? Yes, I mean, where are we going to send the power then? Now we're back into the same boat we are dealing with Quebec as what we were 10 years ago. All right, we're going to stop right there and, and let Mr. Martin weigh in on that. Thank you, caller. Thank you. Those are that's, they're really good questions, actually. What happens if Amera and the, and the PUB in Nova Scotia says to Amera and the government, this is not a good deal for us, let's walk away? Well, well, Randy, we thought of that. And, uh, you know, when we did this project, uh, you know, um, and I said, look at it from a business perspective, you're investing, uh, you know, billions of dollars. You want to reduce your risk. So you want to establish a situation where you have more than one route to move your power. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, as you expand your further developments, you want to be able to have an additional uh, transmission available to move those out. So what we did, if you remember, um, you know, several years ago, uh, we did apply to Hydro Quebec for some open access to move recall, and we were successful in that. Uh, and we have a, approximately 300 megawatts of, uh, of capacity that we pay for all the time in Quebec, and that's the way they did it. Unlike Amera, the deal we did, we only pay as we go as part of an overall arrangement. No, in Quebec, we pay for that full, uh, you know, what they call firm capacity. Uh, we don't use all of that capacity. We need to buy enough capacity to move power in the summer when there's a lot more available uh, to us because it's not being used in Labrador. So we had to buy enough capacity there to move it at peak times in the summer. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. So in the event, uh, you know, the Amer arrangements for some reason uh, didn't move ahead, yeah, we still have right. the opportunity. We still have available capacity going out through Quebec on the recall that uh, we can move the majority of that power, and we don't have to deal with Quebec on that at all. That's stuff we're doing day-to-day -day right now. Mm -hmm. So we do have capacity there to move uh, uh, most of the power. But, uh, but 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 no to Amera doesn't mean no to Muskrat Falls. Is that the, this project would go with or without the Atlantic link, I'll call it. And that's what we've been saying from the outset. We make decision one is what's good for Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, the Amera side is, uh, is, is something that uh, we're doing to move excess power plus create more transmission capacity to be able to further develop. It's, look, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great thing for the province, but right, from the perspective of moving to power, we do have alternatives, and we won't be left, uh, we won't be left holding the bag. But right, our best right. bet is to have two routes with enough uh, uh, transmission capacity to, to push through there to cover our risk, but also create more development opportunities for Newfoundland and Labrador, both on the island and in Labrador. All right, first question, which I made the second one. Industrial rates versus residential rates from the Muskrat Falls development. Are these new industries coming in getting an industrial rate that is preferential? Um, so that's being worked on uh, right now uh, in the province, and that's a policy decision that the, that the province would have to make. So um, I'm, not a, I'm, you know, I'm not at liberty to describe how that would be, but I think uh, the principles that, uh, you know, that are used in other provinces and that would be used here is that you try to take the benefits of low-cost, uh, you know, we call it recall power or low-cost power. Uh, you take the benefits of that and try to spread it to most of your of your customers, both residential and, and industrial, and then uh, you know additional power uh, over and above that, the costs have to be covered uh, one way or another. So that blend is what's going to cause uh, you know uh, what's going to come up with uh, industrial rates in Labrador and residential rates. That's a policy decision the governments are working on right now. Understanding Muskrat Falls is coming on, so it's something that we're going to have to. That's something that, outside that, the actual jurisdiction of the developer in this instance, Nalcor. This is something that the province would have to make a policy decision on. Yeah, there's no question because if you know from our perspective. It's cover the cost, uh, mm. you know, and we build the power. And Bob, Bob's your uncle, and we're done. If, yeah. the, if the province, uh, we don't have the power, or we're not in that business of saying to a particular developer, we're going to give you lower cost or higher cost. That's power. up to the. We government. just, pay, we, you want it? Here it is. Here's the cost. But you pay that. You're no problem. We're done. The, if the government wants to incentivize it to get, a, to get an industry here, an aluminum plant or something. That's their call. That's not yours. their call. Absolutely. Ed Martin, we're going to stop right there. I want to first of all thank everybody who got through with a question this morning. We have many, 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 many others here as well that came in on open line and, and whatnot. Uh, we thank you for your interest, obviously, in this this morning. This was a pretty, I feel, informative program, Ed Martin. I'm delighted that you were able to do it. We've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to give you an opportunity, obviously, to make a little statement here to do a wrap-up on all of this for us, uh, you know, and what is it? Tie a bow on it. So... You know, thanks, Randy. First, I thank thank you, and, uh, and I want to say to folks listening that uh, we do appreciate the questions, and uh, we know it's an important thing for them to listen to, and uh, we're going to continue to be as transparent as we possibly can. I think it's, it's once again it's fairly simple from from my perspective. Uh, you know, we need the power. Uh, we've done the uh, we've done all of the analysis uh, at this point. Muskrat Falls with the Labrador Island Link is the lowest cost uh, option for the province. Um, I look at okay, that's it. Now, is this the right time to do it? 
Uh, look, we create surplus power for Labrador. Uh, we are investing in an asset. All the money we're now putting into this asset is going to Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, we're building an asset for ourselves. We're not, we're not, we're not uh, putting our cash out to oil companies uh, that we'll never see again. This is going into an investment in Newfoundland and Labrador. The benefits are intergenerational. It's a 100-year investment. It's clean power. Interest rates, we're not going to see these interest rates again for a while. We have arrangements with AMERA, uh, which enable us to do further developments. Uh, that's a big thing that we, uh, you know, it's there now, and we have it in hand. The federal loan guarantee has been offered to us, and it's there. Um, you look at the significant construction benefits on this job. We have a water management agreement in place for the first time with the Upper Churchill. We have the INU uh, agreements ratified. Uh, we understand this technology. It's hydro. We have the experienced workforce. For the first time in many, many, many or I guess ever with all the developments we've done, uh, we have the we have the cash available from uh, the oil developments right now. As we said in the energy plan, let's put some of our non-renewable resources into renewables. Um, market opportunities are there in the Maritimes, and we structured it so that we can make money on it without uh, without risking uh, Muskrat Falls power. We have two routes available to us to be able to manage that risk, both out through, through Quebec and uh, and into Nova Scotia. And uh, basically, we're saying this looks like the right arrangements for us right now. And that's a good thing, and we're moving ahead and doing something uh, for the first time in our history. We have the opportunity to do. I say now is the time to make that move, make our mark in the country, and say we are in playing at the at, at, at the parents' table now. We're going to develop our own resources. We do have control of what we're trying to achieve, and now is the time. Now is the time. Ed Martin, the uh, chief executive officer for Nalcor. Uh, I, I keep calling it Nalcor Energy these days. Is that the what's the right title for this company? Nalcor Energy. Nalcor Energy. Thank you. Thank you for doing this today. We appreciate it once again. And I have no doubt before this is over, we might ask you to do this again, Ed Martin. Uh, but we appreciate your taking the time today to come in and spend a whole two and a half hours answering uh, our questions on it. And I have no doubt as we reflect. There will be commentary associated with today's program. Everybody, that's it for us this morning.